Listo. Uh, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you this morning uh, for this symposium. As some of you may know, Trevor was my PhD advisor at the University of Chicago uh, when I started a while ago. We're just going to leave it at that. Um, and it's been a really long time that we've been planning for him to come to Colombia on a holiday. He's been really, you know, motivated to come bird in Colombia. And um, he gave me yesterday this post-it where you can barely read from like our first meeting where he stood me up <laughs> a really long time ago. And it reminded me that ever since we've been planning this trip to Colombia. So it's, I'm very, very excited that it finally become a reality that he's here and that not only he came, but he also came with his really good friends that happened to be amazing biologists that I really admire. And we got to organize the symposium. Uh, we named it the Sex, Color, and Behavior Symposium, but I think in reality it's the Trevor's Birthday Symposium. <laughs> so we're just going to all get together and celebrate his birthday with this really good science. I hope all of you get to, a chance to talk to them and to enjoy the talks. Um, I'm going to also uh, give uh, some room to Daniel, who organized the symposium with me between uh, Ingeniería Biomédica and uh, Biological Sciences. So I really hope you guys enjoy the day and welcome. Thank you, uh, Natasha. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to, to, to be able to share this space with uh, Trevor, Mark, uh, Ben, and all the students who will be presenting today, and former students of us. Um, we didn't plan a whole lot what we were going to say today, but I was just thinking um, what, what have been my interactions regarding the, with the work of the people we're going to hear today. And I well, I've heard of Trevor for since I was a, an undergrad, probably his work on um, uh, speciation in birds and, and all that was an inspiration to me. But I remember the first time I emailed Trevor, I was a grad student and I asked him for a PDF of a paper on the evolution of a plumage pattern. And he told me, here you go. You're one of the few people interested in this paper, which is my favorite paper of mine. I remember you said that. Um, but of course, I've been inspired by your work on, on ecology, uh, diversification in mountains, uh, speciation, all that uh, has been uh, great. Um, for my uh, graduate work, I was interested in the geographic ranges of species and how species interact competitively to set range boundaries. So I remember reading out a paper I had a hard time with, Kirkpatrick and Barton, 1997, on the evolution of range margins, uh, full of theoretical models, but uh, I found like really interesting how, from a theoretical perspective, we could inform questions about ecology and evolution, and that was very inspiring as well. And then uh, I've known sort of the, the work on long-term studies of, of natural populations of birds you have been involved with has been also inspirational for us in many ways. We were starting a sort of long-term uh, study of a, a finch here in the mountains above Bogota. We call it long-term, but it's been running for like seven years only. Uh, but we hope to be able to have a lot uh, to say about that uh, in the future. Uh, so today we sort of we have uh, well the three talks by our invited speakers. Uh, we have a former uh, students from Los Andes, Valentina and Roberto, who will be speaking to us, and current students from biomedical uh, sciences and um, biomedical engineering and biological sciences. So we hope you all enjoy. And we were saying with Natasha that. Uh, well, Trevor and, and uh, Mark and Ben are here on holiday, so we want to keep it super relaxed, informal. Um, we're going to talk about science, but feel free to, you know, talk to them, ask questions. Uh, it's supposed to be a price fest. That's what Natasha was calling it. Uh, so let's keep it uh, informal and hope you all enjoy. So thanks, everyone, for being here, and thank 
I know you guys w wanted to spend more time outside and having fun, but hopefully this will be fun for you. So with that, I think Natalia is going to introduce uh, Trevor. Hmm. So again, it's a real pleasure to introduce Trevor. He's going to start the symposium with a talk on the relationship between ant species on uh, uh, vertebrate alone and longitudinal gradient, if I'm not mistaken. Um, did we get to load the talk over there? There we go. Um, so, Lori Goyard. Which one? Yeah. Oh, you want to time it? I want to, yeah, I don't want to run the long three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Because we have we have transmission at the same time, so that way they can hear you. Okay. Thank you. We'll start. Yeah, there's a, a marvelous story um, of Sewell Wright when he was like 96, going to the University of Michigan when I was doing my field work in the Galapagos. And Peter Grant said, marvelous to hear Sewell Wright talk. You know, he's one of the famous population geneticists. He said after an hour and a half, he was up to 1923. So, you know, I have to watch it because as I've got older, I tend to ramble on. And I was hoping to not give a talk here today, but I really appreciate Natasha setting all this up. I love talking about science. I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone else so I can get this one out of the way and relax. And I would like to thank Daniel and Natasha for organizing this. It should be, I hope, a fun time. Uh, so what I want to do is um, talk about ants and birds. Uh, and the reason I want to do this is partly because I want to really know what's going on in the Andes. And uh, people here might have some intuition because we're not 100% sure we're right. Uh, um, and you know, this is sort of a paper that's hovering on the brink of being published or not. So, so the work I'm going to talk about is uh, a collaboration with Umesh Srinivasan and Kartik Shankar at the CES in, uh, in Bangalore. And uh, Supriya, who was a graduate student with myself and Cory Moreau at the University of Chicago, and she's now at UCLA. And so what I want to do is talk about, do I have to stand here or can I walk around? <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, I want to just uh, talk about the distribution of bird species across islands, across the mountains. And you know, this big discovery, which was that uh, in many places in the world, um, uh, I'll move this on. Oh. In many places in the world. Birds, the number of bird species is not as many factors, but the most basic amount of the species is not. So maybe about 30 years ago, it was discovered that quite a few places, that many more species of birds in the middle than birds by the northern tower. So this was summarized in a paper by uh, Christian McCain uh, in well, 2009. She identified four different factors. Uh, each one of them was an So, uh, we looked at about 70 studies, each of about 40 of them, showed this classic monotonic decline. Another corner showed a plateau, another decline. One of, another corner showed a little bit of a rise, another decline. Another corner showed a strong rise. So, when she published this paper, uh, she suggested that. The reason you get this rise and decline is because the amount of the dry basin over the water line, you have higher productivity in the middle, and that high productivity in the middle. But we know, uh, I think it's how do you get the pointer? Take the pointer and put something there. Well, um, since then, uh, as a result of the uh, work by the Matthew Kibbeo, formerly of Los Angeles, is he another one of Daniel Kibbeo's staff students? 
uh, comes to the table in nature, and you can see, you can see that the game's explanation must be incomplete because there are a whole bunch of tropical mountains where you see uh, a, a mid elevation region. So here's the eastern Himalaya, the mountains in the middle, here's the very uh, rift valley in Africa, here's the Northern Islands. So we've got tropical islands with no evidence of dry places, uh, with more species in the middle. And uh, so the question is, you know, uh, why? I bet it's the whole time I'm not in charge. That one? Oh, it works anyway. It's another challenge. This. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this basically illustrates, illustrates the point. Uh, here we've got a study from Puga Hidal, which, by the way, Quintero and Yetz treated the Andes as one mountain range, with just one statement that you get a decline like this. That's something I'd like to know about. But anyway, if you look at Quintero and Yetz's data, you get this classic world kind of decline in the Andes. If you go to the east of Himalayas, you get a mid elevation peak. And what you can see is that the Cain's hypothesis fits really nicely because it's just as excellent productivity in the Andes. You've got a nice decline in bird species because of the productivity in the Andes. But you don't get that in the Himalayas. If you like, if you can't in the Himalayas less, then it should still be declining. Uh, and, and you should still see more species here. So you've got this gap here. There is too few species per bird in the Andes. So, when Supriya came to. Um, good. Uh, yeah, and it's not bad. So, so this, this peak in bird diversity is quite surprising because most other groups show the linear decline, the monotonic decline in elevation. So these are three studies from the East Himalayas where birds peak in the middle, and you can see the amphibians, ants, and past uh, sorry. The previous ones were pastorans, but none have amphibians, so uh, so this carries it out. What we're stuck with is pastorine birds, so the mid elevation peak is interconnected. When you look at this further, you find that the uh, in passing bird richness is entirely due to the subfigurous birds. If you look at uh, radivores, frugivores, nectaridores, you again see a decline. So the explanation has to lie more unlike pretty much every other group who says the world is a high risk of the So when Supriya came, oh sorry, so we set out the we set out uh, to look at this and ask, is it producing the number of insects? So we take quite a lot of time measuring insect abundance. So this is the number of individual insects, not the number of species. And we found that there are indeed many more insects in the middle of those because they are lower down, which is surprising given the productivity is higher than the The very detached insect, you can probably see it. It's in a diagram with a branch, four or more insects in the branch. Think about that. We've got a lovely correlation between the number of insects, the total number of insects, which is the number of individuals, and the number of insectivorous species of birds. So we made this argument that more insects mean that you can partition up the niche more. It's an argument that goes back to the Eagle Hutchins study in Macarthur. So you can squeeze more species in. And that's where we left it. And then Sophia came along. And we noticed that what was happening is I've already shown you this in terms of um, from the species of ants. With the density of ants, it pretty much there are no ants at mid elevation in the world. Whereas the beauty of the ants are high elevation. 
This, it turns out, is a remarkable feature of all tropical islands, of tropical mountains, and the most tropical habitats. It clearly ended as well. In fact, it was a result in dancing in the morning. Why are the ants here to my ears to talk about? So we began to wonder if there was something about the presence of ants now and then that it could compress it in some curious direction. Now then, the weaver ant. The weaver ant is a rather remarkable species of ant. It's a good story because it makes these amazing nests with you know, the pools on the ants, but it needs leaves to go. Part of the ant. Is a, a love song. It's an insectivorous ant. It eats insects. They are little, not other people. And it's pretty amazing. So, uh, there have been studies on this. No one realizes that there's little wolf packs all over in the lab. So, this is an example of a praying uh, mantis. It just happens walking along in a tube, and one ant grabs its leg. It's a very unhappy mantis to have. It turns out it tries to escape. All the other ants are coming on. And it's basically a dead ant. It's like a wolf on loose. It's run by wolves. And it turns out that these ants really have some incredible insect predators. So, who knows? You want this one back? Um, it turns out that these are, uh, I can turn down now. It turns out that these ants are incredible insect predators and they've been used, uh, they're the oldest biocontrol agent. They've been used for over 2,000 years in China. People would string ropes out from the jungle and these ants would run out into their citrus groves and eat, eat all the insects. And they're still used as a biocontrol agent in uh, Australia in mangoes. And there's an amazing manual from, from organic mango orchards in Australia about how to use these ants. So uh, in this manual, it has pictures of an ant catching a bug, ant catching another bug, ant catching a beetle, ant catching fruit fly, ant catching two other species of leaf beetle, ant catching thrips, ant catching bug, ant catching leaf roller, ant catching on it goes. And the, there's a few problems with using these ants. They're very efficient at keeping all the bad insects off of mangoes. But there are a few problems, and I'm only going to tell you one for instance of time, and that is ants are known for their aggressive behavior, which annoys people during fruit harvest. So if you try and pick a mango in an organic orchard, the ants run up your arms and they start biting you. So in the manual, it tells you how to avoid this. You sit on a golf course and you spray water up into the trees, and then the ants will run into the nest, and then some other person runs up and gets the mangoes before the, all the ants come back out again. Lots of interesting stuff. But anyway, let's get to some back to some science. So, um, so uh, what we did was we set out to ask, could it be that ants are really depressing insects enough to at least contribute to the driver of this mid elevation peak? And this is the area where we've worked for a long time. It's North Bengal in the East Himalaya. So uh, this is the uh, site which is full of these weaver ants at 150 meter elevation. And this is where uh, Supriya did most of her work. Um, so she did two things. So it turns out that weaver ants are incredibly dense. There's about two, 250 weaver ants per meter of forest, but not every tree always has weaver ants on it. So the first thing she did was just to look at uh, what she did was she found paired species of trees, which she paired for species, uh, species tree species name and, uh, and height. And when you do that paired test, and then she used that bagging technique. And I just am pointing you to beetles and, and uh, moths, uh, caterpillars here. And this is the one to one line. And you can see that trees without weaver ants have many more beetles and moths on them than trees with weaver ants do. And I should say, by the way, this has been done a lot of times in orchards, which show the same result. This is the first time it's been done in a tropical forest. And, uh, and so um, this is just Supriya 
who then did an experiment where she removed ants from 15 trees and had 15 control trees and put um, Mrs. Supriya with two of her assistants and this is the tangle foot she stopped to stop the ants running back up the tree again. And so uh, when she did that, she found that over one month, the number of beetles and caterpillars increased by about three or fourfold, whereas they more or less didn't change on the ones with the uh, weaver ants. So both experimentally and just observationally, the presence of weaver ants substantially depresses caterpillars and beetles. Uh, and that's important because um, uh, she also did an estimate of diet overlap between the insectivorous birds that are there and the um, ants. And she, she did this by using barcoding. So when she did DNA barcoding, what I've done is I've just ranked the number of bird feces that had different kinds of, uh, of uh, insects in them. Uh, so nearly every bird feces had a caterpillar or a lepidoptera and had a beetle. And then it dropped off to um, hymenoptera, hemiptera, uh, cockroaches, and spiders. And you can see that the ants are consuming pretty much all of these except the spiders. So that all the requirements are there for the ants to compete with the birds. So I'm not going to say this is driving all of the mid-elevation peak, but I, it, it could well be contributing to the low insect diversity at low elevations, which is contributing to low bird diversity there. So with that, um, that's our hypothesis that uh, Ecophila uh, depresses insects, which then causes the birds to go down. So then Umesh and Kartik and I decided to go back to the uh, famous uh, Quintero and Yetz paper and ask if there was a correlation between where the peak in insectivorous birds occurred and the presence of this weaver ant so the weaver ant itself consists of two species that are basically allopatric replacements of each other. One species, the one we've been talking about, lives in the tropics of Asia and the other one in the tropics of Africa. So we, we looked at the places where weaver ants were and asked if they're the places where you get mid-elevation mid peaks in insectivorous bird species. And that's what you do. So we predicted that if this is um, taking Quintero and Yetz's 46 mountain ranges. And these are the mountain ranges that don't have Ecophila. And these are the mountain ranges that do have Ecophila. And this is an estimate of the species point on the mountain range, which has peak species richness as computed by Quintero and Yetz. So you can see that in mountains which have Ecophila, you have a very high, uh, peak, the elevation at which you get the species peak in richness is at 1,000 meters, whereas when you don't have an ecophila, it's typically at the base of the mountain. So you see this, it, it, it fits the picture because ecophila was only depressing insects, so you see the difference when you've got insectivorous birds, but you only see it slightly with omnivores. And when you look at frugivores, nectarivores, and granivores, you, the pattern goes away. So these two bits of evidence lead us to suggest that, uh, uh, also this is just the statistics, I don't know why I put these in here. Uh, oh, I do know why I put, the, put them in here. Across 46 mountains, um, diet in three categories, insectivore, omnivore, and um, others is highly significant. Insectivores uh, are the things that are shifting their peaks and ecophila is highly significant as contributing to that shift in peaks uh, but productivity and precipitation McCain's original which clearly does contribute to some of these peaks is not significant when you put them all into the same model so we believe that um, mid elevation peaks are in insectivorous birds and by extension all birds because they make up the majority is attributed at least in part to predatory ants of which Ecophila is the killer. Great, now I can sit and relax. <laughs> so, 
you were saying that you're curious about what happens in the Andes, and I was trying to think, and actually here we do have predatory ants, but people think of those most more as facilitators and competitors because, so we have these army ants that flush insect prey on which a lot of bird species specialize. So could it be that ants are competitors on that side of the world and facilitators here? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. We talk about that. I think it's like 340 bird species or something are army ant followers. So we believe they're facilitators. And the question is, could the, f and you have predatory ants that eat insects in the foliage actually as well, which is where Ecophila mainly is. So we, we thought about this a bit and uh, it'd be great to write a paper about how much the facilitation is helping. But I don't know if the facilitation would cause a deep, you know, to the extent I've thought about it, I just wonder if uh, if you remove all the facilitators, then you would expect to see something that matches productivity, but it's depressed over that. But I would love to know about how much predatory ants are affecting foliage here, because people do use uh, native South American ants as a biocontrol agent here as well, uh, but they presumably just not as efficient as Ecophila. But yeah, I mean. We'd love to work on how much facilitation is going on here too, because we don't have army ant followers in, in the Himalaya. Well, we're right on time if I stop now, so. What did you want to ask the um, Is this, yeah. So I think there's some work in Europe suggesting that tree creepers are particularly prone to competition with ants because of, um, I guess, exploiting trunk habitats. And I wondered whether you'd dug into the sort of foraging niches of species at all and asked whether, you know, sort of trunk foraging versus twig tip for foraging species are differentially affected by ants. I, I'm not really sure what Ecophila forages, but these, I think, are you know, the tree creeper interaction is with uh, wood ants that build big terrestrial nests and forage up and down tree trunks. So is that a possible further dimension? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I uh, Ecophil is everywhere. Yeah, you don't want to drop your caterpillar anywhere. But, um, but it is very interesting because actually one of the things that led us into this whole study was Holdobler's work, which showed wherever there was one of these big wood ant nests, all the trees around it were defoliated, uh, sorry, were green, whereas in places where there wasn't a wood ant nest, the trees were completely defoliated in some years. So, so clearly wood ants were affecting the leaves as well as the trunks. But remember, you know, the final fun fact, of course, is that the biomass of ants across the world is more than the biomass of all, uh, all other vertebrates, I think, but certainly all mammals and birds put together. Okay, thank you so much. So we're getting ready for our next talk. Um, the next talk is going to be some students out of my lab. Uh, where they're going to present some work they're doing um, on doing brain in situs to understand the role that certain genes have mediating social behavior, particularly mating behavior. Um, this is a work in progress, so they're going to show you the, um, the results they have so far. Um, with this, I'll just give the floor, like, if the talk is ready. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hi everyone, uh, we are Amaury and Catalina, and today we're going to show you how we are unlocking the secrets of Goopy social behavior. <laughs> social behavior is the interaction between individuals of the same species. For example, it can be aggression or nurturing between a mother and their child, or mating behavior when a male wants to attract a woman, a uh, female to mate. And it is this social behavior that determines the fate of the species by impacting processes that influence animal fitness. But the question is, what drives this broad range of behavior in all of the species? So to answer this and to understand the evolution of behavior, we need to study the nervous system and the molecular mechanisms that uh, bring this behavior. So this behavior is mediated by neural activity changes in the brain uh, because of gene expression changes. It is, now, it is now known that social behavior is in vertebrates can be explained at least in part by changes in neural activity in the brain and by gene expression networks. So these networks form a bigger network that is, that is called the social decision-making network. Uh, this network governs stimulus evaluation and social behavior in vertebrates. And there are two neural circuits that form this big network, which are the social behavior network that you can see the regions of the brain in yellow and the mesolimbic reward system that you can see the regions in blue. The regions of the brain that belong to both are in green. And the important thing about this social decision making network is that it is highly conserved among vertebrates. This means that it doesn't matter if we are studying either a bird, a mammal or a fish, the molecular systems that regulate behavior are conserved. Some studies have shown the divergence of some the divergence scores of some genes across the areas of the social behavior net, of the social decision making network. And as you can see in the red color, most are very conserved among the five taxa of vertebrates. So we can actually study the teleost fish, for example, and the nuclei belonging to the social decision making network. And this can bring us new insights about the evolution of behavior and also help us generate homologies to other vertebrate species. So now, now talking about the specific animals that we are using in these species, we're using the cellulose, and his decision-making network is formed by the medial and the lateral dorsal telencephalum, the supracommissural dorsal and ventral zone of the ventral telencephalum, the preoptic area, uh, the ventral hypothalamus, the anterior tuberal nucleus, the center gray, and the tuberculum posterior. This is the social-making network in cellulose, and the specific uh, species that we are using is the posilia reticulata, that is a fish that have a strong selective sexual behavior and is really useful to these uh, studies of behavior and related also with these uh, neurogenomic studies. One of these studies is if the study of Bloch et al. in 2018, the thing that they did was to take some group of females and expose them to an attractive male during 10 minutes and they took another group of females of these species and exposed to an adult male and also exposed another group of, of females to another female and they did, did this during 10 minutes and what they analyzed was the specific neurogenomic response in the telencephalum and the optic tectum of the female fish that were looking to their partner and they found that in the different behavioral tests you have a specific neurogenomic response that is occurring in the zones of the brain in each treatment. So you can see in this, in this principal component analysis that there are some group of genes that are expressed uh, differentially in the different treatments that you have. So you can characterize um, a specific neurodynamic response to every treatment that we are doing. And this tells us that the decision making process is related with this neurogenomic, neurogenomic response. But these um, studies uh, make uh, to emerge new questions. And this is that you study a lot of genes and the output of these stories generate 
hundreds of, the, of genes that you don't know uh, specific what these genes are doing in the particular way. And also, we know that the expression vary in a more specific nucleus, not just in the telencephalon or the optic tectum, but you have um, these zones of the social decision making network that are uh, really related with the uh, different um, behaviors that we are studying. So, the thing is that we answer, we want to answer this question, that is, how do the spatial temporal expression patterns of candidate genes in the social decision making network change? when a female of posterior reticulata is in a social or a mating context. We want to take some candidate genes of the study of Bloch et al. and to study them in a more particular way. So the thing that we did was to take the transcriptomic data of Bloch et al., to take the genes that were differentially expressed and to mix this data with literature and by informatic analysis to take to uh, have these um, this pool of candidate genes that we want to analyze in a particular way. So in order to accomplish our objective in this study, <clears throat> we followed this methodology. So first for the behavioral test, we first selected some males from our stock population and analyzed the colored areas and iridescence. And based on the, the males that had the best colored areas and iridescence, we selected the most attractive ones to perform the behavioral tests. Uh, this test, so we exposed a virgin female either to another female or to an attractive male. Each test was performed during 10 minutes and during 30 minutes, and we used four, four females per treatment. After the behavioral test, we euthanized the females and then extract the brain. After the extraction, we cryosection the brain tissue in the cryostat and then we end up with four slides per brain with each of the cryo sections of the brain. <clears throat> for the riboprobe design, this process was done for each of the candidate genes that were mentioned before. We first designed the primers, then perform a nested PCR, and after obtaining the region of interest of DNA, we transcribed that region to obtain the RNA, but we marked that RNA with DIG UTPs. And finally, we purificate the riboprobe. This seems like a short process, but it is actually quite long. And after having the riboprobe, we perform the in-situ hybridizations. Uh, this is uh, divided in three days. On the first days, we hybridize the slides. So the riboprobe binds to the RNA where the gene is expressing in the tissue. On the second day, we incubate the antibody that recognizes the DIG UTPs in the riboprobe. And on the third day, we perform the color development reaction. So we add the substrate on the enzyme and we end up with color on the regions, on the regions that the gene is expressing in a bluish purple color. And finally, to quantify the gene expression and the color measurements, we use the software ImageJ <clears throat> and we measured the intensity of the nuclei in the social decision-making network, the intensity of color, and normalize it with the tissue that did not change color. Well, before to talk about the results that we are going to present, um, the first thing is that the results are really preliminary results. And also, um, before to show us the graph that we have, um, it is, um, useful to talk about to talk a little bit about the genes that we are studying. Um, the first group of genes that we study is the is gene related with glutamate, that is the principal neurotransmitter, excitatory neurotransmitter of the central nervous system. So for this um, for this neurotransmitter, we study AMPA receptors that are that is a, a ionotropic receptor in the central nervous system and is related with excitatory, with excitatory synapses and a process that is known as long-term um, induction that is a way of, of generating plast 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 plasticity in the, neural, in the, neur in the neurons and it's, a, and it's a process that is related with learning, memory and all important behavior and, and, all, and, and another group of important behaviors in <clears throat> related with, uh, with, synap with synaptic plasticity. In general, for these AMPA receptors are made for some subunits, and this and one of these subunits is encoding by is encoding by the gene GRIA3. So for this gene, you can see um, the results that we have in this graph. So you can look in the axis of X, all the nucleus of the social decision-making network that we told to you 
um, um, in the past moments. So you have from the dorsal to the encephalon to the central glade. And um, for each nuclei, you have a color that identifies that identify that nuclei. And also you have for each nuclei the two treatments that we are analyzing. So in the strip patterns, you have the attractive male treatment, and with no pattern, you have the female treatment. So for each nuclei, you look to the comparison of expression for each uh, of the treatments in each nuclei. And this is the graph for the study that we did at the 10 minutes. So you can look that when a female looks to an attractive male during 10 minutes, there is an expression of an increment of the expression of these genes in every of the nuclei of the social decision making network. So the thing that they want, that, that these results tell to us is that probably um, the, the, number, the, number, the, the numbers of of excitatory synapses that we are having and um, this, this uh, male treatments are increasing uh, because of the function of the receptor that this gene is related. Um, for, for the 30 minutes, um, um, we have a um, little later because we lose uh, a lot of a lot of information during the process, but we can look that we have a little expression compared to the 10 minutes um, of the treatment. Another subunit of that receptor is GRIA2. For that gene, you can look at the results here, and there is no um, like clear difference as we look in GRIA3 uh, treatments, but we can look that there are specific nucleus in which we know that the uh, expression of the gene is, is changing in the different treatments, but for this gene, we cannot see that uh, clear difference that we see for GRIA3 gene. And another type of receptors that we study was the N-methyl-D-aspartate receptors that are also related with glutamate. And they are being related with uh, social relationships in rodents. And these receptors are, again, uh, codified by subunits. One of the, of the genes that codify one of the subunits of these receptors and green one, uh, is green one gene. For this gene, <coughs> we obtain these results that you are looking into the screen. So as you know, um, um, there are some parts of the, of the social decision-making network, for example, the ventral hypothalamus, when they see difference between the two treatments, and the difference looks to be like more important than 20 minutes. And this told to us that this is a, a, a gene that have like an important role in social behavior principle because the treatment that looks to be um, increment is the, is the treatment when a female looks to another uh, female so it is uh, like a different when you look the the genes of AMPA receptors and the genes that are related and um, with the NMA, the NMTL the aspartate receptor. And finally, finally the gene AGAP3. This is also a gene that encodes part of the ND NMDA receptor that was mentioned before for uh, Green One. And here we can see that there are not many differences between the treatments in the nuclei. But we do see that there are some posterior nuclei, for example, the, the tuberculum posterior and the preoptic area, that we do see some differences in the nuclei of the expression when the female was exposed to another female. So this may indicate that this gene is important in the social interactions rather than in the mating context. With these preliminary results, we can have some conclusions. First, uh, the gene GRIA3, we did find that it is overexpressed in a sexual in a mating context. This may indicate that there is an increment in the excitatory synapse in the social decision-making network. Uh, we can also say that due to this met method sensibility, because we detect either color or non-color, uh, it is possible that we cannot detect some slight changes of expression in some genes, but we do see that there are changes in the expression in each gene across the nuclei belonging from the so to the social decision-making network. And for some future work, we first need to finish all of the candidate genes that we're going to study uh, and finish all of the, of the results. Uh, we could also use more females per treatment, so we can use uh, a statistical analysis to analyze the differences of expression between the nuclei. And it would also be very interesting to measure some variables of the social interaction. For example, the slides, the glides, and the anxiety when the female is exposed to the other female or attractive male, and look for some correlations within the expression of those genes in the different regions of, of the brain. Thank you very much for your attention.
questions? I was going to ask you before. Uh, I was going to ask you before. I was going to ask you before the end. Uh, your last thing about what, why do females even care about other females? Why? What are they doing that causes their hypothalamus to, to get raised? Yes. So what we have found with these results is that actually social interactions in this species of guppy and Poecilia reticulata seem to be very important, even more than, than males. And these were females that were virgin and have never seen a male in their lives. So maybe what, when they're exposed to another female, they recognize, they see, okay, this is a female. I, I can kind of play. I've been living with a female my whole life. A rather than with a male that is completely new to those females. Hi, I have seen a lot of studies uh, using a uh, peculia, uh, but I don't know what kind of light do they use because I don't know if uh, you have considered the importance of the ultraviolet uh, reflectance and the behavior of the peculia. I know there is not only a way for being a peculia because, for example, in in some chocoan species of peculia, uh, the reflectance of ultraviolet seems to be very important. Yeah, uh, they have a reflectance in the eyes. I don't know about guppies, uh, but I think it could be important because the bolder males I have seen are always in the sun. Yeah, but the shyest males are in the in the shade. So I don't know if it could be important uh, to have some ultraviolet in the analysis that you do in the laboratory. I don't know. So about these questions, the, um, it is normal in some studies that we are looking into literature that um, when you have a species that have iridescent, which hoopy, with goopy halves, and you are compared a dual, an attractive, and a female treatments, you can use uh, some, some, some material to block the iridescence of the fish and to create different treatments to compare when you have a fish that have iridescence, a fish that have no iridescence, and to look if there is a different response in these treatments when you are looking um, to, to to this different contest when a female is looking to a male that have different characteristics. Um, but the thing is that in this analysis that we're doing here, we're not comparing um, the, dual, uh, the dual male treatment. We are just compared when a female is looking to an attractive male and when a female is to look into just another male. So in these in this, in this experiments that we did, we just consent, we just centered into the into the attractive in general of the of the male. So we measure all the correlation of the male, we measure like the how long is the tail of the male, the gonopodium of the male, all the sexual variables, and we quantify how attractive was this male. And um, we take the most attractive males that we have in the population and present that males to the females. So we just compare attractive male to female. But in literature, it is also possible to have a tool treatment that you can block, for example, the iridescence and to look at um, the impact of this, of this change into the treatments. But um, that was something that we are not um, studying here. But thank you for your question. Thank you for your presentation. Very nice work. Um, I have it's a two question indeed. So if I got it correctly, uh, what you're implying is that there are different networks for female or same sex social decisions versus um, opposite sex social decisions. And then if that's correct and the genes are conservative uh, in the different main taxa, if I study birds or rodents, let's say, can I look into the same candidate genes and try to get at the same uh, network paths or patterns? Uh, so the thing about the social decision-making network, like I mentioned, it, is that it is highly conserved. And in the graph that I showed you that it was with red, uh, there are some papers that have analyzed the divergence scores between some genes that are involved in the nervous system uh, some genes and across the nuclei, and most of them are conserved. So yes, like we can create homologies between a teleost fish, for example, and a bird, 
uh, but we do have to analyze uh, what happens with uh, ex exactly that gene in another species. But th that is the important thing about the social decision-making network, that since it is conserved, we can create homologies between other species. Uh, I want to know how how you determine how attractive is a male. Like I know that you measure the color um, and you measure the kind of volume, but how you summarize all these variables and you determine a value of attractiveness? Um, well, for, to do that, uh, the thing that we did was to create a model um, and um, and a species of est a mathematical model to determine attractive. So we measure of the of the variables in the male, for example, the area of the black spots, the area of the orange spots, uh, the ledge of the gonopodium, and all the variables that are related in that male with the attractiveness. And after that, we make that variable to convert in a number, and we create a statistic that make us to differentiate the more attractive males of the population compared to the other males that are not too attractive. So the thing is, in summarize, we take all the characteristics of the male and we extract them, convert them to a number, and after that we obtain another number that it is related with the general um, attractiveness of the male that is a proxy of how attractive is that male consider where what is attractive for these species. So that's the way that we use to compare the attractiveness of the males of the different uh, of the different treatments that we are using. Bueno, se pueden hacer la pregunta super breve, Mauricio. Ah, era uh, hi, um, I have always been curious about uh, the guppy fish because they are used for social behavior studies, but I know that it's not properly a model. So um, how do you think that it will change the behavior of a uh, guppy fish from example, uh, from a low altitude uh, sample guppy fish from a high altitude uh, guppy fish? Because I know that uh, this fish express some genes related because uh, of the environment that he lives. Um, so yeah, that's my question. So how can change um, the goopy fish behavior uh, from the place that it sample? So the thing is that, as you said, um, this is not a specific model that is um, well known and completely studied and um, all the genome and what is this fish. Um, you know, as you have several fish that have been studied in a lot of populations. So, but these fish have his particular, um, you know, well, things that are good for, for a study behavior. The first is that have a enormous brain plasticity um, that we, when you compare different populations, for example, than one study that we did um, last year. And in that study, we compared different population of Colombia and we'll look about differences in the brain of the different population based on, um, you know, different um, environmental uh, pressures of selection. And we found that for the different populations, you can have a lot of difference in brain based on the environmental variables that you are looking for. So it's a fish that depending on what is the environment, change a lot his brain anatomy. And it is really interesting to, to study that and to look how is that body and what tells that you, to you about the plasticity of the brain. And also to answer the question, is a model that have an easy way of reproduce, so it is really easy to have the, this model um, in the laboratory. It's a fish um, that is really easy to, to maintain, so have a lot of advantages to use it at a model of a study, um, because give you a lot of facilities. And also compared to several fish, you can have like and um, more natural difference because the life of seraphis that you use are lines that have been in the laboratory for a lot of years and that you know that um, when you have this um, selection in the laboratory during um, all that time and that can modify the natural behavior of the species but we are using here and um, to these studies and um, populations that were isolated and um, really early in and, and this is really helpful to study and um, how this population is 
reacting in the natural environment and not just, uh, and not just an experimental of, of laboratory line. So that's why you use these species. Um, thank you for the question. Okay, so next talk is going to be by uh, Maria Lisa Mendiwelso. Ma Maria Lisa is an undergrad here at uh, Uniandes who's studying uh, UV reflectance in avian eggs. Um, and she's advised by Dalio Campo, who was a former student in my lab, who's now a, a PhD student at uh, Princeton University. Um, so, hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about the hidden world, uh, the hidden world of egg coloration, but the hidden world for us. Um, so I want to start by asking you guys a question. If you remember as a kid collecting something like stuff, coins, uh, stamps, well, some kids take it a bit further. And that happened with an emeritus professor from this university, Cornelius Marin Kelly. He used to collect eggs. <laughs> and what started as an activity with his uh, father and grandfather turned out to be a long life hobby. And the, over the years, the collection grew bigger and bigger. And um, then in 2001, he decided to donate it to the Humboldt Institute. And this is how the collection looks um, today. But the interesting part and fascinating part about this collection is that it's the biggest oological collection in Latin America, and also one of the biggest uh, collections in the, um, focused on tropical bird eggs of, of the world. And um, this collection is actually really big. It has uh, over a thousand species and over 150 families, and it comes from many countries. Um, but what can we learn from X? We can learn, learn from them evolution, ecology, reproductive biology, and many more. But the interesting part about the X is that by looking at these collections, we can understand these early life history traits that with other collections is maybe, are maybe hard to find. And here, I want to focus on these two main um, aspects, sunlight protection and visual cues. But why are eggs so interesting, apart that we eat them in our breakfast? <laughs> um, they are uh, comparing them to um, uh, seashells or bones. They are one of the fastest biomaterials that form in nature. Also, they protect and nourish the embryo, and they also have a wide uh, variety in color, pattern, size, shape, and structure. And that's why they're the most wonderful invention in all the history of vertebrates. And if we look at the embryo, it has a multiple line of defense mechanisms. So first, we have the egg that helps to give the um, uh, gives strength and also helps with the conservation of water and diffusion of gases. But also we have what is the nest. We can have open nest, closed nest, or nest that or birds that put their eggs in cavities. And also, uh, ah, wow, 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 qué pasó? <laughs> Devuélvete, por favor. <laughs> más, más, más. <laughs> Más, más, más. Ay, eso. <laughs> uh, we also have the um, parental behavior, if it's biparental or uniparental. But besides that, we also have the environment. And here, I want to focus, of, uh, um, focus in the light exposure. Each egg is laid in a different um, environment, and each environment has its unique light exposure. So we have uh, birds as ostriches that lay their eggs right in the floor in open habitats. But then we have this one that is the whooping mammoth that lays its egg on eggs on burrows. Um, but I want to take a step back and tell you guys, like the first, ask you guys what's the first aspect that comes to mind when you see this picture. The first thing I thought was about color. Um, I didn't know there were red eggs, so that was 
still to find out. Uh, and just for clarify, color is the intensity of a specific wavelength. And us humans see uh, in the wavelength of 400 and 800 nanometers. And with this in mind, we have found that the main pigments of eggs are biliverdine, which is responsible for the blue and green pigments, and protoporphyrin, which is responsible for the red and brown pigments. But as many biologists here may know, birds can, or some birds can also see in ultraviolet, uh, the ultraviolet spectrum. So, eh, okay. What happens in this ultraviolet range? So what do, you, do we know about the function of this UV coloration in X? Well, the main focus of this area has been the parasitic X. Well, there are some studies that says, said, say that birds use actual UV reflection when recognizing non-mimetic parasitic X. There are also some studies that say that UV coloration does not cue for egg reaction. So even though this is the most study area of uh, UV coloration, we still need more <laughs> exploring to do. Um, and um, while I was reading about this, I also asked if the own parent can detect its own X. So a study done by Aviles et al showed that the eggs that have more U reflection are those placed in cavity nests or closed nests. And with that, he said that maybe this helps for the parent to recognize its own egg. So we would expect that closed nests have more U V reflection. However, there are other hypotheses, non-signaling functions, that by knowing that exposure to UV radiation can have detrimental effects on the developing embryo through, well, the production of the annihilations, we would think that this UV radiation must be reflected. And also, I want to add up this, that we know that white is the color that reflects all, color, all, yeah, all colors, but it must also reflect UV color. However, there are other uh, articles that say that actually pigment can work as both a parcel and a dark car effect. Parcel, since it helps to block some of the light that goes into the embryo, and also a dark car effect because it uh, overheats the egg. And with that in mind, we would think that in openness, contrary to what I said before, X must have more UV reflection. And that's what I want to answer. I want to see what are the drivers of variation in UV reflectance of vertex. And by this, we have three different objectives. The first one is to describe the variation in ultraviolet reflection, reflectance of vertex in nests with different exposures. Uh, the second one is to determine evolutionary patterns in the variation of UV reflectance of X according to the two proposed hypotheses. And the third one is to test potential life history and environmental drivers in the variation of UV reflectance. And with those objectives in mind, we followed the Alba et al methodology. And for each egg, we took three different samples, one at the equator and one at each um, pole of the egg. But what happens if the egg had spots? Then we took it, six measurements for, for each egg, both for the spotted area and the background color. And with that, um, <laughs> I measured about um, a thousand eggs, which turned to be <laughs> Uh, seven, uh, eh, se me fue el número. 773 <laughs> species. <laughs> um, this happened because I tried to take at least two eggs from the same species from different, different clutches. And with the, that data, I used the uh, package POW to find the relative contribution of the UV range to the total brightness. And um, here are some pictures in the collection. This here is the curator of Birds and Eggs, and uh, this here is my director. And 
we also uh, had to find the ecological life history and environmental factors. And as for the ecological, we used next exposition, which varied from open, closed, and cabinetness, which was habitat density, which is open, semi-open, or closed, and for life history traits, which we took immaculation, which is divided into two, immaculate and maculate. Immaculate is that the, white, the egg is totally white, but maculate means that it has either spots or any base color. Uh, we also used egg size and uh, incubation period, and for environmental factor, we choose the central latitude. So this year, you don't have to see the data here, but it's, it's just to show you guys the diversity of data we have in this study. We have over 30 orders, and the variation in nest exposure and habitat density, well, it's quite big. And these are the pre preliminary results. The, the um, video in doesn't help a lot, but um, from the half up is the non-passerine orders, and from the half down are the passerines. So as you can maybe see, um, the UV reflection, which are the uh, purple lines, is more concentrated in the passerine order rather than in the non-passerine. But in the non-passerine, there are... Um, <laughs> Um, we can see there, there, there are some clays that do have a lot of UV reflection. And here we can see in the Vanellus uh, genus that many of them reflect UV. And even though there are, their eggs are brown with black spots, there is no variation in the exposure of habitat and the density, uh, the habitat density. But if we look closer, to the Caprimugides uh, order, we can see that even though there is a lot of variation, whether as of habitat density and nest exposure, there are some species that do present UV reflection. So we have to find what are the life history behind aspects behind those, those uh, examples. And with this, we also run phylogenetic generalized lineal mixed model and Preliminary results suggest that there are support from the hypothesis of protection in open nests. That means that UV reflection was found more in open nests rather than in closed nests. However, not all open nests, uh, not, not in all open nests, um, the eggs reflected UV. And we also found that maculate eggs have more uh, predictive power on the model. And since this study is still on course, uh, we still have to find what pigments are involved with this uh, greater UV reflection. But also, there must be another... <laughs> must be other factors involved uh, in um, the reflection of UV. And studies suggest that the cuticle may also be um, working may also be influencing whether an egg reflects more or less ultraviolet. So in this study, they showed that eggs with no cuticle had more UV reflection. And with that, I want to close up this um, presentation by telling you guys, if you want to study color, it's like these collections of eggs are really underused. So it's a great way to start by these collections and by um, learning also about eggs that they're really fascinating. And well, I also want to thank um, everyone that has been helping with this project, uh, Jorge Molina for uh, giving me the spectrophotometer and Gustavo Londonio for helping me with ideas uh, of this project. And well, you guys for listening to me about eggs. <laughs>
Do you think is there like a relationship between the UV reflectance features of the X and predators activity? Yeah, actually, I have I deleted that um, the epale, I deleted the uh, slide because I didn't know about the time. But I had this slide hidden, and they say that UV reflection actually makes the predators see the eggs more easily. So in this study, they blocked the UV reflectance with a substance, and I don't remember the substance in this moment. And they found that the blocking the UV, which are the black uh, boxes, it had less depredated. Uh, they were less uh, depredated nests. So it does play an important role. But to find those that data with all of these species is really difficult. So so yeah, to answer to your question. Uh, almost same question, but then I was amazed about the Caprimulgidae. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe that's the reason, because the Caprimulgidae are they night active birds, so maybe they can use the reflectance of the moonlight to find their own eggs, but they are not exposed to the same kind of predation than the day birds. Okay, that's that could, could also could be an explanation. We still have a lot to see in those specific families, but. Um, well, as I told you, I'm still in the discussion part of this um, study. <laughs> so I have a really short question, so everyone can go for coffee. But <laughs> I was wondering if you see any correlations between the UV reflection and the actual patterns of the eggs, because I know in Princeton they study the patterns of the coloration a lot. So if there's some kind of, you know, association between how they can produce these pigments in, in which patterns and the UV reflectance. Okay, so I haven't, I know there is a software which helps to see how are the patterns distributed in the egg. However, um, it could be interesting for another study. <laughs> so it hasn't been done, so it hasn't been done but um, what I want to do here, uh, well, I think I want to, I still think I have time, is that since the maculation had a high uh, predictive power on the model. See uh, if it had mostly on the X with spots or the ones that only had like the one color. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, don't, I know I'm not asking, uh, uh, no, no, answering no, your question, good. but. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So we have 10 minutes to go for a coffee break. Unfortunately, we're five minutes late, so we have 10, 15 minutes for coffee. It's right outside, so you guys can stretch your legs, and then we'll come back for March stock. Sí, sí, sí. No, pero el delay está bien. Solo que a veces no era tanto el delay, sino que eran los botones. Pero... Entonces lo mando para allá que ya sí se entiende. Ah, listo, sí.
Bueno, seguimos. Okay, our, our next uh, invited speaker is uh, Professor uh, Mark uh, Kirkpatrick. Uh, Mark is an evolutionary geneticist and uh, evolutionary biologist at, um, in the department of, he's a professor in the department of integrated biology at the University of Texas in Austin. And he's done work on a variety of different fronts, in particular in the evolution of sex chromosomes and sex determination, uh, the evolution of genomes, uh, and a lot of work on uh, theory related to um, sexual selection and speciation. So I'm sorry, Mark, we, we brought you indoors. You, I, I hope you don't miss a lot of bird species today, uh, but thanks for joining us. Um, thanks so much to, uh, to Daniel and Natasha for organizing this. So this is a really uh, wonderful opportunity for me to meet you all. This is very, very fun. Um, the year before the, about a year before the pandemic, I got to go to New Guinea, which is a destination that I had been dreaming of since I was a graduate student. And that part of the world has some of the most remarkable animals on the planet, including this animal. Um, and actually, I'll do a little historical aside since this is a Trevor Fest. Uh, Trevor and I, early on in our careers, collaborated. We're very, very interested in sexual selection. And this animal here is one of the planet's best examples of that. This is a flame bowerbird. And so I took this picture after we'd been watching this animal display for about a half an hour. And it was one of the most remarkable things I'd ever seen in my life. So this is a bower. This is a structure that he can, he, the male made. It's not a nest. It's strictly there to attract females. This is the female who's watching him display. What is he doing? He's hopping around on one leg, holding his wings out at very awkward angles, making really stupid sounding noises. At one point, he picked up a purple berry, which he had stashed right next to the bower. He held it up to the female, looky, looky what I've got. This male has a superpower. He can contract the irises on the, his two eyes asynchronously. He's, that's the only bird, maybe the only tetrapod on the planet who can do that. So I, anyways, I collapsed after watching this. I was just like, I couldn't talk for a half an hour. It was such an amazing experience, seriously. Um, seeing this just triggers all sorts of questions in our minds, right? So what, as Trevor and I wondered about for so many years, what the hell caused the evolution of the female mating preference for this kind of ridiculous behavior? What are the neural pathways that are going on and changes that are going on in the female that cause her maybe to consider mating with this male? But really, basically, a very, very simple question that this immediately triggers is, look at how different the male and female are. How is it that evolution can create organisms that are of the same species that are as different as different species are? So that's particularly extreme in the case of the flame bowerbird, but it's, of course, true in our own species as well. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. <laughs> um, males and females of our own species differ physically, right? But we also differ in how our brains work. We differ in the pain pathways in almost an infinite number of different phenotypes. But you might think that differences between the sexes of flame bowerbirds and people and other species are the result of natural and sexual selection that have optimized 
males and females to have the highest fitness with those traits. And that turns out to not be true. Let me give you an example. 1,001, 1,002, 1,002. Thank you. Um, so this is from a study from um, Sanjak et al., Peter Vischer's lab. Uh, what we're looking at here in, in the open bars is the distribution of body height in females in the United Kingdom. In dark blue is the is the uh, distribution of body heights in males. Well, look this curve. Whoops. Uh, okay, I'm carrying on. Uh, this curve is showing the lifetime reproductive success of females. The dash curve is the lifetime reproductive success of males. And what you can see is a female whose height is that much shorter than the average female has 15% more kids over her lifetime. Males that are that much taller than the average male have 15% more kids over their lifetime than the average male does. So males are taller than females, yes, but natural selection is trying to make them even tall, males even taller and females even shorter. So natural selection has not optimized the sexes with respect to height, or I think with respect to a whole bunch of other stuff. Why is that? It turns out that almost any mutation that increases height in males and is beneficial to male also increases height in females and is bad for them. Any mutation that decreases height is great for the females, but bad for the males. So this is an example of what we call sexually antagonistic selection or SAS. I'm going to refer to it as SAS because that's much easier. So this is a situation where a gene has a beneficial effect or a mutation has a beneficial effect in one sex and a detrimental effect in another. Why should you care about that? Well, it's ultimately what drives the evolution of differences between males and females. It also, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have time to explain all of the logic behind this, but it is also true that genetic diseases in humans, many of them, for example, schizophrenia is in part present with a very strong genetic component because of sexually antagonistic selection. Um, it has important demographic effects, and I'll show you that in just a bit. And it's also thought to be important to the evolution of sex chromosomes. So we think it's a fundamental evolutionary process. But it's also really understudied, and here's why. We think of sexually antagonistic selection as the dark matter of the universe. So dark matter is stuff that we know is there, but is very, very difficult to detect. Sexually antagonistic selection has that property also. Should I go over here and click the slide? Is it? Is it? Oh, it does work now. Um, okay, let me, let me give you an overview. Um, we now have people who those of us who work on evolutionary genetics have a whole toolbox that allow us to find places in the genome that have been subject to natural selection. And this is just one study of hundreds I could have shown as an example that are lighting up places in the human genome where in the last 10,000 years there has been selection to cause adaptation. For example, this is the gene that allows uh, what's called lactase persistence, which allows adults in many populations to digest milk, okay? So uh, these kinds of studies use signals that develop in patterns of genetic variation that build up over thousands of generations. Now here's the problem with sexually antagonistic selection. Our chromosomes move between males and females in every generation, right? And because of that, these signatures of selection that are built up in one generation that distinguish males from females get erased because a chromosome that was in a male in one generation is now gonna be in a female in the next generation. That eliminates any potential that these patterns that take hundreds or thousands of generations to build up can do so. So that makes it really difficult to find evidence of sexual, uh, sexual antagonistic selection using genetic data. Well, the story I'm going to tell you about now, 1,001, 1,002, 
um, starts with a study uh, from a remarkable postdoc in our lab, Chen Dei Chang. And uh, we came up with this notion that we might be able to develop an entirely new approach to studying patterns of genetic variation that uh, involves a uh, sort of a, I was going to say technology, but really a, a philosophy or an approach that we call detecting selection in real time. And so what is that? Here's the thing. Allele frequencies on autosomes, this is a, a fact about Mendelian inheritance. At conception, males and females had the same gene frequencies, okay? During our lifetimes, if there are particular mutations that increase survival in one sex but decrease in the other sex, what that will generate are really, really, really tiny differences in allele frequencies between males and females. And those are going to get erased in the next generation. But if we could detect them in this generation, that would let us find sexually antagonistic selection. So how are we going to do that? We're going to measure the differences in allele frequencies between males and females, and those will be the effects of selection in the current generation, not 10,000 generations ago. And the problem that we face is these differences are really, really tiny. So we're going to have to be a little tricky about how we detect them. Uh, so let me tell you the actual, what we actually did. Um, we got data not from our own uh, resources, but we went to what's called the Thousand Genomes Project, which you too can download the data from. Confusingly, the Thousand Genomes project has 2,000 genomes in it, but don't worry. Um, 26 <laughs> populations worldwide, about 6 million SNPs, those are genetically variable sites in the genome, about 6 million sites variable in this data set across the whole genome. And what we're going to do is look for differences between males and females in the frequencies of the bases, A, G, C, and T, at those 6 million sites. And we will measure that difference using a statistic called FST. It doesn't really matter what it is. Let's just, just take that as a measure of sex differences in allele frequencies, OK? OK, now, um, um, I'm going to show you a graph where this is the thing of interest, the sex differences between males and females at 6 million sites around the genome. And this axis, this is what we actually started the study motivated by, but in the end, we didn't care about it. But it turns out if you plot the data this way, it works out really nicely. But just to tell you what this is, this is whether a gene is expressed more strongly in females or in males, OK? And so what I'm going to now show you is 6 million data points where each point represents a particular gene. Here are the differences in the allele frequencies between males and females. And this is whether the gene is more expressed in females or in males. And Shazam, that's the result. So we get this characteristic pattern that we refer to as the Twin Peaks pattern. And what you see is that there are very, very small but highly statistically significant differences in gene frequencies between males and females if you take into account the entire genome. No individual gene is statistically significant, but if you take in the entire pattern, it's highly significant. And um, it's even better than that, Shazam. We, oh, we see the pattern within each of the 26 populations. It is repeatable across populations. And as I mentioned, no individual gene is significant, but if you take the entire pattern as a whole, it's highly significant. So we think we've got strong evidence for sexually antagonistic selection across the genome in our own species in this current generation. Um, so um, we published this paper, um, and other people got interested in it. And the similar pattern was just uh, detected in guppies and in stickleback fishes and several other species. We thought, this is great. You know, people, this is a real thing. It's going down the road. People are seeing this pattern. And so a number of papers came out saying, yeah, sexually antagonistic selection can be seen in genomes using these kinds of approaches. Oh, but then the bad news hit. You know, there's always a high and then there's the low. 
uh, after this sort of, um, thank you, after this brief moment of uh, happiness, a series of papers came out with deep skepticism about this pattern. And several people uh, claimed that this was an, uh, an artifact. And actually, there's a very interesting, well, I won't go into the details, but there are some subtleties to how the data are analyzed that are tricky to get. It was several papers came out saying, no, 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 no. This is all an artifact, or we don't really believe it. So we thought, hmm, we sort of really still do believe it. We're going to have to go back to work and see if we can actually make this a more convincing thing. So the, uh, I'm now going to tell you about more recent work. This is by um, in collaboration with my graduate student, uh, Jared Cole, and our remarkable, relatively new uh, faculty member, Orville Harpak. Um, so the three of us have been working, trying to hunt down signatures of sexually antagonistic selection using a really much, much better data set. So let's stop screwing around. Let's get uh, some really big numbers. This is the UK Biobank. It is the world's biggest genomic database. It's got whole genome sequence from about a quarter million people in the UK. And uh, we've got the data set that we're working with is a reduced data set that has about a half a million um, variable sites across the genome. And we're gonna do the same trick of looking for very small allele frequency differences between males and females. But in addition to getting a much bigger data set, we're going to use a more powerful statistical approach. So what we're going to do is take advantage of the fact that in this data set, the data are phased. What does that mean? So the way that data typically come to us from DNA sequencing is you know what an individual's uh, base pair is at this site and at this site, but you don't know which chromosome the A came from and the T came from. It could be on the same chromosome or on different chromosomes. UK Biobank tells us that. So what does that mean? Well, we've got actually a whole string of sites that are variable. And for each individual in the site, in the, in the study, we have two chromosomes. We know their sequences at those two chromosomes. And we can use that data in the following way. Imagine that this is a chromosome, and these are the genetically variable sites. And that site is subject to sexually antagonistic selection, and these other ones are not. What's going to happen over the course of the generation is very small allele frequency differences are going to build up at this site. But something else is going to happen, which is that these other sites are going to go along for the ride. And this is a genetic effect that's called hitchhiking. So what will happen is we expect to see a pattern develop uh, in which there is a big difference between males and females at the site that is selected, but the neighboring sites will also show some differences as a result of being pulled along. And we'll see this sort of tent-like or mountain-like pattern of allele frequency differences between males and females. So now that we know what to look for, we can make a fancy mathematical model, and that's when people like me get excited and people like Daniel get really depressed. <laughs> and I understand that, no, no offense meant, but we can actually calculate what's called a likelihood of there being sexually antagonistic selection, and we can estimate how strong selection is. We can estimate selection coefficients. Cool, let's go. So we're sort of in the middle of this project, and I'll just show you one thing that we've done. One of the things we can do is go to the literature, and there are studies of phenotypes that we know are under sexually antagonistic selection. So for example, the width of the waist, the width of the waist is selected to be different in males and females. It's selected to be broader in females and narrower in males. Body mass index is selected to be higher in females and lower in males. So there are a bunch of traits we know are selected to be different in males and females. But there's more, which is we have from other studies, lists of genes that are associated with those traits. So obvious thing to do. Let's look at the genes that affect the traits under sexually antagonistic selection and see if our method lights up. Shazam. So this is a p-value. This is how statistically unlikely the data are if, if it's random. 
These are traits, body mass index, waist circumference, basal metabolic rate, uh, cholesterol level, body fat percentage. These are all phenotypes that we know are intersexually antagonistic selection. Here's the significant line, genome-wide significant line, by aggregating all the thousands of SNPs associated with each of these phenotypes we get highly significant results. So I can't wait to publish a paper that's titled, We Told You So. But, <laughs> but I think we, we have strong evidence of sexually antagonistic selection using a much, much better data set and some new statistics. Well, um, so here's, here's the thing that really excites me right now. What we're saying is that these differences in allele frequencies are caused by differential survival between males and females. If I've got an A at a particular site, it might be bad for males to have an A there, and I might die sooner. Females might live longer if they have that particular mutation. What that means is that this selection is actually causing mortality in our species. So here's a question for you. We claim that we are showing that there's mortality because of sexually antagonistic selection. How much of all human mortality is caused by this? 0.0001%, maybe 1%, maybe 10% of all human mortality is caused by sexually antagonistic selection. No idea. So I'd like you to go home tonight and write down your favorite guess, and we'll come back in a few years and we think we will be able to estimate this sometime in the next couple months. But I'm really, really excited. I have no idea what that number is going to be. It could be really small or it could be surprisingly big. Okay. So, um, whoops. Sure, let's talk about that. <laughs> Sorry, I edited this talk on the flight down here, so uh, there's some surprises for me as well as for you. Um, uh, yeah. So, this is a story that has to do with sex chromosomes. This is, this is a photomicrograph SEM of an X and a Y chromosome. This highly degenerate blob is why I don't feel so good some mornings. Um, so this guy, Tomasz Sezekli, he's the only of the member of our research team who I've actually met. And uh, we got together over beer at a meeting a few years ago, and he said, Mark, I've got this great idea. It has to do with sex chromosomes. You're interested in sex chromosomes. I'm interested in sex ratios. I think they're connected. And, uh, well, okay, I've got to give you a bit of a backstory. Tomasz is really interested in the adult sex ratio, not the sex ratio at birth, which is the one we usually think about, but the adult sex ratio. And he's interested in that because it has huge impacts on all sorts of social behavioral things. For example, it has impact on mating systems, on the degrees of violence between different species and also within our own species. It affects demography. It has all sorts of um, behavioral ecological effects. So he's really interested in that. And I'm interested in sex chromosomes. And he said, look, Mark, as you know, males have X and Y sex chromosomes. Birds have Z and W sex chromosomes. What's that? So birds, when birds have two of the same sex chromosomes, they are males, not females. If they have two different sex chromosomes, those individuals become females. So it's like a reversal of the situation we have. For historical reasons, those are called Z and W sex chromosomes. So Tomas said, hey, listen, mammals have XY, birds have ZW. We also know that in humans and many other mammals, the adult sex ratio is female biased. Males have shorter lifespans. In birds, it's the other way around. I actually didn't know that before he told me so, but it's well known that males typically live longer in birds. Tamar said, it's the sex chromosomes that are responsible. And I said, listen, we've had three beers, but that's still <laughs> silly. Because how do you know it's the sex chromosomes and not the fact that this thing's got fur and this thing's got feathers? or this thing's got teeth and this thing's got a beak. It could be any of the differences between these two groups. This is an, a sample size of two, right? So Tamar said, no problem, I'll be back. Sure enough, a couple years later, he came back. And he and his graduate students and collaborators collected data on a whole bunch of species where they were able to determine not only what the sex chromosomes were, but also what the adult sex ratio is. And I, I'm just, in awe of this because I wouldn't think there would be 
good data on adult sex ratios in so many species, but a whole bunch of mammals, a whole bunch of birds, but also a whole bunch of amphibians and a bunch of reptiles. Okay, let's get to work because now we can control for phylogenetic effects. And when you do that, you find something pretty interesting. So this is a complicated figure, but I'll hopefully be able to explain it. These are our 287 species or wherever they are organized in a circle. And in the middle is a phylogeny that's been folded into a circle. So it's showing all the evolutionary relations. These are all birds. So here are the parrots and the, here are the raptors and here are the, uh, those are the chickens and relatives, blah, blah, blah. Here are the frogs and salamanders, those are the amphibians. Here are the mammals. Here are the squamate reptiles. Okay, that's what the, the circle's all about. You'll notice that around the circle are two rings that are colored in rather unfortunate colors, but hopefully you can see the differences. Um, whoops, that doesn't work, does it? The inner ring tells you what the sex chromosomes are. If it's blue, it's ZW, so all the birds are blue. If it's red, then it's XY, all the mammals are XY. But importantly, we've got groups the frogs, the salamanders, and the reptiles have variation in the number, in the, in the type of sex chromosomes they've got. So that's going to be really useful. What is on the outside band is the adult sex ratio, where red means that it is female biased and blue means it's male biased. Now, what you can do is sort of squint your eyes and ask the question, is blue correlated with blue and is red correlated with red? What do you think? Well, we actually have statistics that can try to figure this out, right? And when you do the statistics, you can control for the phylogenetic relationships. Before I go there, well, let me do the first cut. It's looking pretty good. So here is the sex ratio, adult sex ratio, where below this line means it's female biased, above this line means it's male biased. Sure enough, XY, female biased. These are the mammals, birds, it's male biased. But let's look at the other groups. Oh, it's looking pretty good. In the amphibians, females are um, more common, excuse me, males are more common in, in ZW systems and females in XY systems. And again, the same pattern holds in reptiles. But within those groups, there are, of course, groups of species that are closely related. So we have to do a proper phylogenetic analysis and we do that we use a method that we've already seen uh, earlier today which is called phylogenetically corrected generalized least squares oh, i hate saying that um, we included not only what the sex chromosomes were but uh, some other factors that we could get from the literature that might contribute to this pattern including body size breeding latitude and sexual size dimorphism we put all those things in the statistical model the only factor that lights up as significant is a sex determination system. And it holds within the amphibians, within the reptiles, and within all tetrapods taken together. And the effect is surprisingly strong. I mean, look at this. this what this number means is that 25% of the variation in adult sex ratio is being explained by the sex chromosomes. So that's a huge damn effect. So next question, why? How is it that sex chromosomes could have that effect, right? And the answer is, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know. But we've got some hypotheses. OK, so just to recap, mammals, amphibians, and reptiles all show this bias towards females uh, being more prevalent late in life when they have XY sex chromosomes, and it's the reverse when they have CW. So Tomash was absolutely correct. Good for him. Um, how could this be? Well. It's possible that sexually antagonistic selection is behind this. If there is sexually antagonistic selection, mutations with different effects on males and females will differentially accumulate on the X and the Y chromosomes, and also on the Z and the W. And under some conditions, that can cause there to be a uh, difference in survivorship of the two sexes to work out in the way that we see in the data. But that's not the only hypothesis. We've got a bunch of others. <laughs> if there's degeneration of the Y and W, recessive deleterious mutations on the X and the Z, meiotic drive, imperfect dosage compensation, physiological 
Anyways, it turns out there are a bunch of other hypotheses that can also explain this pattern. And we do not have a good way of distinguishing between them. I have spent quite a bit of time making mathematical models, trying to figure out how big of an effect each one of these might have. And I cannot make any of these have the effect as large as we see in the data. So I throw this out as a opportunity for some of the students in the room. You might think about how could we test different hypotheses for what is contributing so much to sex differences uh, in longevity resulting from sex chromosomes. Um, you know what? I think I might stop it right there because I think we're at a fine, fine time to stop, yeah? Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. So how can you estimate the proportion of human mortality that is due to sexually antagonistic selection? Um, so what we can do is computer simulations where we have a certain fraction of sites in the, in the genome under sexually antagonistic selection and a distribution of selection coefficients. And we can simulate how big the distribution of allele frequency differences between males and females will result. And then we're going to use a fancy method called approximate Bayesian computation to ask what combination of how frequent SAS is acting on the genome and how strong it is best uh, generate the kind of data that we see. So we're going to try to match up the simulations, what we're seeing in the real data. Hope it works. So with the, um, the sort of within generation sexual antagonistic effects, um, so I guess the UK Biobank data will probably have age at which individuals were sampled. So have you tested whether those effects are age dependent or whether, for example, female effects are seen in connection with, you know, being pre or post um, having had children or so on? So. Excellent question. Um, unfortunately, the UK Biobank uh, sample is over a fairly narrow range of ages between about four, almost all the people are between 40 and 60 years old, unfortunately. However, um, what I'm not showing you is the part of the talk that I threw out on the airplane, which is we've got another study with stickleback fishes in which we've sampled them at three different ages in life. And we're going to try to determine at what point in life selections act, SAS is acting on them. So we're very interested in exactly this also. Yeah. So I was curious, when you have seen the implications for the gene-like systems, so whenever like, there is no control, you know, two discrete steps is being uh, determined by the sex chromosome, but you know, other kind of polymorphisms. Oh, uh, yeah, great, sure. Um, you know, I, hadn't, I, I think of sex chromosomes as being super genes, really, but your point is very good that there are other kinds of super genes. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say I haven't thought about it, but let me just uh, throw something out there. So I can easily imagine that uh, there are super genes, for example, in butterflies that control color polymorphisms. And I can easily imagine that in those chunks of chromosome that are controlling color patterns, there are also a whole bunch of different mutations that have effects on different effects on males and females. So that'd be really interesting to look at. Uh, hmm. Maybe you should write a grant. Maybe you should write a grant about that. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think like the size of the normal combining region will determine whether the effect is more drastic? Oh, that's a, oh, now you're getting into really subtle subtle areas. Um, I I've been very impressed by how poor of a correlation there is between, uh, for example, chromosome inversions and sizes of non recombining regions on sex chromosomes and almost anything. So I would totally expect intuitively there to be a strong correlation because bigger chunks of chromosomes have more genes. But a number of people have looked at that in several ways and no really clear signal has popped out. I, I don't know why. Good question. Yeah. And so I wanted to know the, the UK gene bank. <laughs> yeah. It's the genomes are all from UK? Like yes, they are. And do you think that represents like any limitation maybe in the foundings that could vary between different populations? That's an excellent question. So um, the UK Biobank is either good or bad, depending upon how you look at it and what you want to do. 
but um, about 90% of the individuals in that sample identify themselves as British white uh, ancestry. And when you actually do the genetics, you can figure out what ancestry people actually have. And people are actually quite surprisingly quite good at reporting that. So about 10% of the people in that uh, sample are from you know, Pakistan and South America and all the rest of the world. But 90% of them have really deep ancestry just in the UK. So we have actually filtered out all the non-white British people because having mixtures of ancestry creates all sorts of difficulties with the analysis because you don't know whether it's the thing you're looking at or something correlated with the ancestry. So we're going to, I think, find out something about British white individuals that may or may not apply to other populations. And I'm going to be most satisfied with our conclusions if we are able to replicate them in other populations. So we are hoping to do that. But great question. Um, so I have a question that integrates your first part and your second part. I, I hope I can be clear and not reflect my confusion about it. But um, so because females are homogametic, I was wondering if when you say you have higher mortality in a sec in like one of the two sexes, in your data, can you see whether the higher mortality corresponds to males and that over the generations creates differential mortality yeah. or is it both? Uh, it's an un, the, the data we have, great question, the data we have do not allow us to know. Okay. All we can tell is that there's an allele frequency difference between males and females. We don't know whether it's because males were dying quicker, females were dying quicker, or both. Do you think you can integrate that with your second data set, looking at species that have those such compensation and those that don't, and see if you see these differences in the same way, or, or too complicated? Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to have to think about that. I don't know. Because you have a really large data set and a lot of those species don't have dosage compensation, right, so it might right, be a way right, of... Right, right, right. Ooh, let's talk more about that. We'll have time. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we're going to continue with the next talk. This is uh, Diego Martinez from my lab. Uh, Diego joined the lab as a PhD student a little bit more than a year ago, and he is doing really interesting work to understand what all the variation that we find in nature and in the developed brain actually means in terms of cognition and in terms of a lot of the social variables that we look at in the lab. Um, so with one further ado, I'll just give you with the talk. Okay, so good morning everyone. So as Natasha mentioned, I'm a doctoral student in engineering. And today I'd like to talk to you about like the research that I'm currently working on in my PhD. We're trying to uh, learn from guppy fish what we can learn about a cognition environment and the relationship between those two aspects in order to understand brain evolution. So, okay. so just to give a little context, and um, as you may know, since times of uh, maybe Darwin or even uh, earlier, uh, 150 years ago, there is a talk that having a larger or a bigger brain uh, confers uh, the animals in general higher mental capacities, or in other words, uh, larger cognitive abilities. And actually, that's generally true. They have, there are a lot of studies that have studied this in several groups of different animals, or in particular in mammals. And they also have tested uh, their cognitive abilities and have found that correlation. And among of the, all of those groups that have been studied, the one that I want to highlight are the fishes. And that's because actually they represent like the 50% of the entire diversity of, uh, of the vertebrates. And that's because they have occupied uh, several or even thousands of different natural habitats. And as a result, they have conferred them myriad of different brain forms and brain sizes. So these are an important or a particular good opportunity to try to understand how the brain evolves, but also if fishes have 
uh, a lot of differences in the brain size of the brain shapes. Maybe we could try to uh, correlate that to the, their cognitive abilities. And that's actually something that also have been studied. So there is evidence that having that higher cognitive abilities uh, are present in fishes that have larger brains. And the thing is that uh, in most of these studies, they use uh, fishes reared in the lab, whose uh, those differences in brain morphology are usually created artificially. Like they create different lines of fishes that present a larger or a smaller brain, and they analyze the cognitive abilities. But what happened with uh, the wild fishes? So this is important to take into account because as you, may, you know, well, in nature, there is a lot of environmental variables that set like the uh, energy, call, uh, energy demands that animals have, and also the cognitive requirements that usually fishes need to survive in nature. And well, the thing with that is um, those em environmental variables are going to direct uh, uh, how is the way that fishes are going to develop their brains through time. So maybe in some cases, in some particular environmental variables, it will be better to have a larger brain, uh, depending on the requirements that they have in the habitat. But in other cases, it will be better to reduce the size of the brain and use that energy to increase the performance in other aspects of the anatomy of the fish or in general physiological, physiologically other aspects in the fish like reproduction or food intake. So this actually has been studied here in Colombia and I think that I'm already talk about it uh, previously about this study when this story was done by some of my colleagues of my research group. And what they did was to study 18 different Colombian populations of Poesiria reticulata. And they analyzed, well, their differences in brain morphology. So what they found is there were actually differences in their brain morphology between, between the 18 populations. And also they relate some of the environmental variables and ecological condition to those differences. So uh, taking into account these results, uh, like I said, the main objectives, objective of my research. That it was that could be summarized into main questions. So the first one will try to understand how those natural variation in brain morphology affect the cognition in wild guppy fishes, and the other question will try to understand how those that environmental variables shape well that brain morphology, and I will do that like analyzing a different population uh, different population that have differences in their brain anatomy. So the way that we do that, uh, we use a study, particular to the animal that will no surprise to us, that is uh, the guppy fishes. And they are very useful to use it to this kind of study because they are very easy to maintain in the lab. And also because when we bring them from the wild, they retain their natural behaviors. So what we did was to like collect more than 200 wild fish from two particular populations here in Colombia and bring into the lab and start to analyze in their cognitive abilities. But maybe a question that may arise, how do we measure cogn cognition? Yes. Well, we do that by testing their behavior in the lab. And in particular, we can test different aspects of cognition. So I'm just going uh, through all of these three uh, in the presentation. So the first one is the spatial learning, and in particular, or basically that's uh, seeing if a uh, fish could solve a maze. Uh, maze. So the idea, and this work was developed by so, uh, a pair of undergraduate students. I think they are here actually. And they have done an ex excellent work like performing this cognitive task. And this task in which consists in placing a fish in a tank, we have different barriers with some Openings. This is the okay. Some openings that the idea is to recreate a maze inside a tank, and the idea is that if you place a fish in one of the sides of the tank, you will go through 
hold the, the entire barriers and reach the end of the mesh where is a reward that in this case was a female. So in this case is a sexual reward. And by doing so, uh, we collect like uh, one variable that was the time that took the fish to reach to the other side. So as you can see here, like the fish is going through the barriers that in the, in the inside the tank. And they also uh, collect the information from their neural anatomy. So that's the first cognitive uh, ability that we test. The next one is inhibitory control. And is uh, that cognition ability is measured with a particular uh, behavioral task that is called the third task. So this task consists in, in this. So if we place the fish in a tank and put in a, a transparent barrier with a small opening, and the idea that we put a food reward behind that barrier. So the, the idea is that the fish initially will try to go to the food, but it's going to hit to the transparent barrier. So the idea is that the fish needs to take a second step and surround that barrier uh, instead of just going directly to the foot. And from that cognitive uh, task, we measure two variables. The, one wa the first one was the number of errors that uh, the fish have that was measured like the times the fish hits the barrier. So maybe you can see here, like the fish start hitting like the barrier. And then we may also measure the time that took the fish to surround the transparent barrier and finding the opening in order to get the foot. And the next cognitive ability that we measure was the numerical learning. So basically, it's try to understand if a fish is able to count. So we do that uh, showing the fish uh, two different quantities using like these small uh, white cards with uh, black dots with different quantities. And we use a food reward in order to try to teach the fish to associate the food reward to one of the quantities. And the idea is that we co record like the number of choices, the correct choices uh, that fish took uh, to the numerical quantity that we wanted to the fish to recognize. So what have we have found until now? So in the case of the uh, spatial learning, initially we uh, uh, found that it was a reduction in the time that to the fishes to solve the maze after repeating this process during 14 different days. So as you can see here in the graph, these are the days of repetition of the task. And this is the time that they took to solve the maze. So the idea is that at the 14th day, the, the fishes took less time to solve the maze. And in particular, after like analyzing the brain anatomy, they found a significant effect of this result related to the weight of the brain of the fishes. In the case of the inhibitory control, uh, we found a similar result. Uh, we found that there was a reduction in the time that uh, took the fishes to notice the transparent barrier uh, after doing a lot of repetition of this task. And also we found a reduced number of errors that, that was like the fish hitting the barrier. And finally, and unfortunately, in the case of numerical learning, like through a very, uh, how do you say the light, a uh, word that uh, was uh, done like through a year, entire year, we didn't find any improvement in like the performances of fishes trying to differentiate the numerical quantities, even if we repeat this task during 40 days. And basically, if you analyze like the percentages of the correct choices for all the individuals, uh, most of them like presented a value close to the 50%. So it's very similar to like flipping a coin and select one of the sizes that have different numerical quantities. So to conclude about these pre preliminary results, so we could actually evidence those cognitive abilities in the wild reader fishes, groupy fishes that we collect from the wild. And the, those cognitive abilities were related to spatial learning and inventory control. And also we found a possible relationship between spatial cognition and brain morphology. The thing is that if we want to try to found a very significant uh, 
relationship between brain morphology and cognition, we need to analyze other population that present uh, larger differences in their brain morphology. So that is, that is like selecting a population that have even larger, a larger brain than those that we use in the lab and selecting our population that have smaller brains. And then like perform the same task in order to see if actually have uh, any differences in the performances of the task. So, so uh, as a matter of future work, we, we have to try to understand that is more the cognitive task. So, uh, and that was the case for the inhibitory control task. And also after like doing the comparison between those other populations, like try to correlate some environmental variables that are found in the natural habitat where those uh, fish sleeps through the brain morphology differences and that have, ha, has already been found in these populations. So thank you very much and I'd be glad to answer your questions. <laughs> Can you be sure it's the brain and not just something connected to the brain that makes the fish swim backwards and forwards faster and therefore get around the barrier quicker? Well, the idea in that, um, that we have with that, that task is try to measure if the fish have a, I don't know, higher cognition as take a second step in the cognitive process in order to uh, like find the food behind a transparent barrier. And well, we try to assure that, um, I don't know, like uh, performing this task uh, through several days and that if that is repetitive and try to uh, measure different variables that could tell that not only just time, but also the number of errors that they took. So maybe it's just just measuring the time. Maybe just fishes try to like exploring and some way they want to find the food in a way. But if you, we perform that several days and we see a reduction in the time and also in the number or numbers of errors that the fish take, well, maybe we could kind of associate that to that fishes learning how to surround that part. First, uh, an observation about, I'm not really surprised about the problems in the cognition results. Yeah, because I have seen that cognition results in, in discus, for example, in cichlids, that having individual recognitions are more prevalent, yeah? So you can expect that discus to count, uh, have difference in counts, because the points on the face are really relevant for them, yeah? But I would say the goobies don't have that system, so it's, it's not something to uh, to be scared about. Yeah. But second, uh, I was thinking about maybe the difference in the virgin females and the older females, the pregnant females that are in the other corner, they could have different profiles of chemicals that are released in the water. Yeah. So the males can be following that kind of a uh, Chiromons in the water, and then that would make them uh, quicker finding the female, not really the the cognition per se in visual parts of the brain. Yeah, so could be nice to standardize the type of female and also the amount of testosterone of the male. Yeah, if the male is kept alone in the aquarium or if it's kept in, with other individuals, because after the the relationship, then the testosterone So quickly, the female into the side. Okay, so just to comment about like the the first part of your question, yeah, I think that maybe the type of uh, I don't know forms and we, that we are showing to the fishes could be important to measure their cognitive abilities in the case of the numerical task. So maybe for guppies that like showing um, small black dots, it's not that important for them. But actually, there are results for fishes, in the case, for example, for several fishes, that they present this uh, same pattern 
and actually they uh, are able to learn. So maybe it's not like it's very difficult for them to like distinguish uh, black dots, but maybe something about the methodological approach that we are trying to use that and those goopy fish are not learning. And in the case of the second question, well, I didn't mention very well in the presentation, but the idea is that when we place a female uh, at the end of the maze, we place them behind a barrier, a transparent barrier, and we only uh, let like the male to interact with the female uh, after they solve the maze. So we like retire the barrier and the male only have interaction with the female at that part of the experiment and they don't have like all the chemical information through the entire maze. So that's something that we, we control in that case. Um, are you gonna perform a histological analysis about um, maybe how the brain size could be related with some regions or nuclei that could be more uh, bigger than the others and this would be maybe related with the cognition of the fishes? And uh, I have a second question. Um, it's a question about terms. I'm not sure if cognition is like directly related with memory or maybe this is a completely different thing or memory it's a part of cognition because it seems like your uh the test that you were developed like the fishes learn because like they have a memory and maybe if the fish collides uh, with a barrier or if he crash he probably will learn that it hurts so he will probably not do it again uh but this is memory not intelligence uh so this is my question. Thank you. So I'm going to begin with the last question. So in relation to cognition, like especially memory is one, is a small part of cognition. So cognition is like a broader spectrum of like an intelligence or like the information that an animal collects. So maybe it could be like perception, learning and that's sort of different aspects of of inside the cognition that makes in general uh the entire cognition that animal have but in this case we are just mentioning uh, some specific uh, parts of the cognition that are in this case learning or memory and how like they were learning in particular for i don't know learning how this memorize the the space or learning if they can differentiate numerical quantities. So it's just a small aspect of, of cognition that we are trying to evaluate. So we can measure any different aspects of cognition, maybe um, like doing different kind of tasks, but we just center it in those that I showed. And the first question, like, yes, yeah, the idea could be like, uh, not, just, not only like analyze the entire brain volume of the fishes, but also what happened in the small brain regions. So, and that's something that has been studied, that some environmental pressure could affect differently, different brain regions depending on their, fish, their function. So maybe in some cases, uh, for some fishes, having a telencephala larger will be better than having an optic tectum larger or smaller. And something that has been studied that is called mosaic evolution of the brain regions of the fishes. Okay, our, our next speaker is going to be Valentina Gomez. Uh, Valentina got her undergraduate degree here and her master's. Uh, she worked in my lab for her master's, working on uh, the links between migration and speciation and, and flycatchers, a topic that she further developed for her PhD at the University of Illinois in Chicago and the Field Museum. And now she's a postdoc at, at Penn State University where she's extended her work on the flycatcher system and also she's working now on swallows and, um, and she'll, she's gonna speak about um, the relationship between switches and migratory behavior and speciation. Gracias, Daniel. Um, thanks everyone for coming 
Eh, voy a hablar en inglés, pero cualquier pregunta que tengan en español, me encanta hablar español, entonces por favor eh, háganla si quieren también. Um, first thing, um, happy birthday, Trevor. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for giving the space for us to come back to our university, which is, it's great to be here. Um, okay, so uh, animals have different ways in which they uh, respond to environmental challenges. And so aphids are a great example. Uh, when the plant where they're feeding on gets very dense, uh, individuals pass from hatching without having wings to hatching with uh, individuals with wings. And not only do they change that uh, morphology, but they also change their body shape. They change their perceptual system, their eyes changes and their antenna changes. And so that they can move to a new plant uh, when it, the resource uh, gets too uh, dense. There are around 4,400 uh, 4, species of aphids or more. Um, and some of them have this capacity of switching between being wingless to being winged. Um, and the questions that sort of like I'm passionate about is whether this behavioral plasticity uh, has something to do with the extraordinary diversification of uh, groups on Earth, animals. So another behavior or another way in which organisms sort of, sort of like respond to environmental challenges is by moving long distances, especially in seasonal environments. And there's examples in fish. So salmon migrate from rivers to the ocean uh, and then back to spawn. Then caribou uh, in mammals, they migrate from uh, harsh climates to less harsh climate and they breed on, they, they survive by feeding on lichens. Salamanders uh, migrate from water bodies uh, to and from water bodies to uh, reproduce. And then there's the extraordinary example of uh, monarch butterflies, which is a migration that is multi-generational and it happens in North America. Uh, although there are some species of South American um, monarch butterflies that also appear to migrate um, and they move from North to Southern, to more Southern latitudes. So, Migration involves some extraordinary journeys. This is the Arctic turn. Uh, the lines that you see here are individuals that were tracked throughout their journeys. Uh, so this green one travels something crazy as uh, 50,000 miles um, in a round trip, which is 90,000 kilometers. It's crazy. Uh, uh, it's estimated that one of these birds in their lifetime, they can go to the moon three times and back. How is that possible? Uh, migration, oh, it's so bad that it, this doesn't show very well, but it has evolved across birds. Large birds migrate, small birds migrate, birds that eat different things with different morphological features. Um, so it's, it's scattered across the phylogeny. It's not restricted to one single monophyletic group. But within species that are migratory, there's 900, about 900 of them that also have some populations that are non-migratory. So there's some intraspecific variation. This is one example. This is the yellow warbler. Um, so the map here shows, so in this sort of pinkish color is the area where they breed, migrants breed. Then they migrate, there's a, some yellow areas where they are like moving. And then the blue is where they spend the winter. But I'm showing here with some arrows, some places where they stay year round. They breed there, they don't go anywhere. These are the two types. So these are migratory. These are non-migratory, especially in the um, uh, mangroves in Florida. And you can see the differences in the environments where they breed. And then this incredible uh, conspicuous change in color pattern, which could be associated to these changes or these differences in behavior. Now migrating requires correlated traits to evolve. They need to know where to go. They need morphology that allows them to fly efficiently without spending too much energy. Uh, they need to accumulate uh, enough fat so that they can fuel those long distance flights. Some, some of them cross the Caribbean Ocean. Um, they also need some timing mechanisms to know when to leave. But being non-migratory has also challenges. So um, non-migratory birds in the tropics, for example, 
uh, face a high diversity of parasites and they also face predation rates and changes uh, related to rainy and dry season. And then non-migratory birds in temperate grounds, um, this is snow, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but they face really, really harsh climates and also reduction in resources. So in theory, switching between these two behaviors, because there are many trade-offs associated with the lifestyles, could potentially drive speciation. And so my research aims to empirically test this hypothesis. So the work that I'll be showing today is, um, is accomplished by collaboration with many, many people. Um, uh, so this is just to acknowledge and to thank everyone who has collaborated with me at different um, stages of my, my career. So I'll talk about uh, this species first, which is what I worked on uh, for my PhD uh, and also my master. So this project uh, started with Daniel uh, here. Um, and um, it's basically what has led me in my path on my career. Um, so this is the, the forktail flycatcher distribution. There's um, populations that are migratory uh, or subspecies that are migratory and some that are non-migratory. The dark blue here shows the area where the migratory birds breed. These are austral migrants, so they breed in South and South America. Then they migrate to North and South America and Central America, uh, which is shown in like lighter blue. And then we have other subspecies that are non-migratory, which are one in open areas of the Amazon, then the Orinoquia region uh, in the Caribbean coast of Colombia, and then this this yellow and this uh, orange are, are considered the same um, subspecies morphologically, but uh, we think it might be two different things. So we first did um, a genomic sampling um, of, of uh, these different populations. And we, what we find in a genomic PCA is that migrants, which are shown here in blue, uh, are distinguishable from non-migrants. And also we find that there is higher um, heterozygosity or variability in the migratory groups and in the, all of the non-migratory groups. And so with that, another uh, population genetic analysis, um, we think that they are different things. And so we wanted to know in the areas where they coexist because they uh, spend uh, a big time of their year together, how is it that they are distinguishable genetically, but they are in the same areas? Uh, so these uh, dots that I'm showing here with blue and yellow are areas where we catch both migrants and non-migrants. And it's the areas where the non-migrants are breeding at the time of coexistence. So I wanted to know, are they in reproductive state? So here I have um, in yellow are non-migrants and in blue are migratory birds. And in birds, we can uh, look at um, some traits that tell us if uh, males and females are in a reproductive state. So females have a brood patch. These pictures are not from a forktail flycatcher, but they're a great example. The pictures by Nick Bailey. Um, and so this is like a, a brood patch that they use to incubate eggs. And then males have a cloacal protuberance. And we find that um, none of the migratory birds were in reproductive state and their, their plumage was actually uh, very worn. So they are not, um, they're not breeding. <laughs> this is a, a, a little uh, complicated graph, but um, I'm gonna walk you through it. Hmm. So the top would be, this is um, demographic um, models of what would what happened in the history of these groups so in the top would be the past and then towards the bottom would be the present um, and then we have the non-migratory groups here and the migratory groups here and what i want to point out for now is that um, in the time after their split the the estimated amount of gene flow between these two groups was extraordinarily low and this is also the case for uh, current estimates of gene flow so it appears that they are they're not breeding with each other. They're different things, although they look very similar. So we found evidence that from a, mig from a migratory population, likely they lost migration in the winter in grounds, which led to allopatry because they are uh, geographically separated. 
so classical allopatric speciation. And then they also sort of accommodated to breed in the tropical grounds. So what, what I want to show here in this graph is this is the estimated yearly cycle of migratory in blue and non-migratory in yellow. And then the red indicates the timing of breeding for each one. You can see they, they do not overlap. So this is also likely speciation by allocrony. And then we find that there is also morphological evolution. So here you cannot see the wings, but it's basically wings in migratory birds are more pointier than wings in non-migratory birds. Non-migratory birds have rounder wings, which are better for maneuverability. And then pointier wings sort of like uh, promote more uh, efficient long distance sustained flight. And then we also found that uh, so males in this species, they sing with their wings. So males produce non-vocal acoustic signals. And because there are changes in wing morphology associated to uh, changes in flight um, necessities, that changes the morphology of the feather, which in turn changes the frequency at which they sing with their wings. So there is also an effect in that aspect of their communication. This is um, uh, work by an undergrad who's here. I feel very weird talking about your research <laughs> when you are here. Um, so Brian Mateus is uh, an undergrad here at University of Los Andes. Um, he's co-advised with Daniel Cadena. Uh, so Brian went to this dot here, which is um, in a nature reserve called Tomo Grande. Tomo Grande uh, is a project that a group of us as undergrad started here at Los Andes. It was, I think, 13 years ago. Uh, so we got together because we were interested in having somewhere where we could do our research, but also a place that would serve as a conservation, you know, conservation for, for an area that at the time was called like the resurgence of the Orinoquia or something. And the idea was that uh, the government was gonna plant uh, a lot of um, mono agriculture. So we decided to start that project, and then now it has been, um, it has had so many research on mammals and plants and uh, birds, and Brian is one of those students. So I bring this up because I, I want to invite any student who wants to work at Tomo Grande. We love having people and just seeing how much work has been done through the years is fantastic. And it was an undergrad project, so this is, um, amazing to see that we now have our research stage. Um, Brian spent a month, month and a half in Tomo Grande observing migratory and migratory birds. <laughs> and he found that um, he was looking at foraging behavior and things that I'm not gonna show here, but I think this result is very beautiful because he found that even though both, they both feed on fruits and insects, he found that the proportion that uh, of, of insects differs in the diet of migratory birds and non-migratory birds. Migratory birds spend more time and more of the diet uh, eating insects uh, than fruits, and non-migratory uh, birds have more, as he says, balanced diet. <laughs> he also found that um, bill morphology is different. So um, migratory birds um, uh, seem to have taller bills and then non-migratory birds are more flattened and then non-migratory bills are also wider uh, than uh, migratory bills. So there seems to be also evolution on, on that uh, axis of, of their biology. Okay, so <laughs> now I wanna go back to this graph and I'm gonna talk about my postdoc. And my postdoc focuses basically on this point of the evolutionary uh, history of uh, these groups. Um, so not in the forktail flycatcher, but I'll show you why. So the forktail flycatcher, we estimate the divergence to has had happened uh, about like 1.4 million years ago, um, which is, is it's, <laughs> it's not a long time if we think about the history of life, uh, but it is a long time if we wanna study the initial processes uh, that lead to speciation. So for that, um, I'm going to start talking about the barn swallow. And this project, um, I had a, a lot of conversations with Trevor when I was thinking about this idea. So um, 
he hasn't seen some of the preliminary results that I will show today. Uh, so this is very exciting because, um, yeah, a lot of his, his input was very valuable. So the barn swallow um, is widely distributed. You cannot see the continents, but <laughs> this is Eurasia and this is America. Um, and these are the breeding distributions of the six uh, recognized uh, subspecies of barn swallows. And this is some amazing work by the uh, Safran Lab. Uh, she has some great work on migratory divides. Um, but what I'm, what I'm very interested in study or when I saw these maps that sort of like pop up to me is this dot. So I'm going to tell you the story of this dot. In the 80s, um, some um, researchers saw that swallows were um, in, in a locality in Argentina, swallows were spending a lot of time uh, during the summer near a bridge. It turns out they had a nest there. They hadn't been reported to be nesting in Argentina before. So it was one nest, something that was just a, a report. And then through the years, more and more nests were being reported. And this thing started expanding. It's been about 40 years. And now this has like a, a wide um, breeding uh, population. So now it's very common that in Argentina, if you go and look under a bridge during the summer, you'll find barn swallows nesting there. So not only did they expand and they established populations there, they shifted their breeding schedules because they used to breed in, in North America uh, during the, the summer there. And now they breed in South America during the summer in South America, which is the winter in North America. And they also reduced their migratory distance. So this is work uh, done by um, Winkler and Nachoareta. Uh, where they put geolocators on their backs and they sort of like saw that the birds were now moving to a different wintering uh, area. And also they reduced that migratory distance significantly. And so this is evidence of apparently very rapid evolution of behavior. Um, so I talked to my collaborator in Argentina, Nacho Areta, and I said, Nacho, this is fantastic. Um, I really want to study this, um, and we want to start by understanding the genomic evolution of these groups. Can we tell them apart in 40 years? Uh, and so this is work that I'm doing with my postdoc advisor, David Tefs, and another professor at Penn State, Sax Spiech. So um, we did, we, this is uh, the first uh, things that we are doing. We generated whole genomes of um, different populations of the barn swallow. So we have um, samples that we collected in the field uh, in Argentina, and then we requested museum tissues from uh, collections in North America. So we have uh, samples from Eastern North America and then Western North America, and then a published data set um, that we found in the literature. So I, I was very surprised now uh, with this result, I thought that we were gonna find uh, the Argentinian birds sort of like within one of the groups in North America, um, but they seem to be distinguishable genetically. This is a genomic PCI again. In PC1, you can see that we can distinguish um, the, the Argentinian bar swallows from the other North American manatee swallows. And then something that uh, I think is worth uh, mentioning is that the Argentinian barn swallows um, are clustering closer to the eastern populations of North America. And the reason why I think this is interesting, although I don't know if there is a connection yet, is that um, swallows in North America are um, suffering population declines, really steep population declines. Some of them have lost 90% of their population. They're just very numerous, so they're so common that it's all, it makes me think of passenger pigeon. We have this very numerous thing, but the populations are declining. The populations that are suffering the most are in Eastern North America. I just thought that was um, a connection and an important thing to bring up. When we look across the genomes of, um, of the samples that we have, so uh, let me walk you through this graph. So here in the x-axis, we have the position in the genome, so each chromosome. 
And then here um, in the y-axis, we have uh, how differentiated comparisons are. So on the top, we have that Eastern North America against the Argentinian population. Then we have Western with the Argentinian population, and then the two North American populations. And as you can see, the Argentinian comparisons, any comparison with the Argentinian population shows um, higher, very high, uh, or not very high, but higher genetic differentiation than the comparisons in North America. Something that I think is worth pointing is that that differentiation, it's not in one peak. It's not like they evolved one, uh, one uh, genetic difference uh, that made them sort of like evolve this new behavior. It is scattered across the genome, so this suggests that there may be uh, an effect of demographic patterns uh, or demographic processes leading to this evolution. We can also look at what differences of each population compared to the other two uh, uh, comes out. Uh, so if we look at just Argentina compared with the two North American populations uh, is the top. Then we have uh, what makes the Eastern North America different from the other two. And then we have what makes Western North America different from the other two, and then, of course, Argentina uh, is sort of like the one that has more changes related to the others. But also, there are some interesting um, uh, patterns in the C chromosome in each one of the different populations. So with that, um, what I'm focusing now is on the role of demographic processes in that initial uh, stage. Um, of course, natural selection would act on what initially settles in Argentina. But if this was a small group of birds that sort of like established in Argentina and that expanded, differentiated, it's not, it doesn't seem to be constant influx from the North American populations, then small population sizes may drive the evolution of these new behaviors. This is not a new idea. So Sutherland has uh, a paper where he says, it is only once the population has almost crashed <laughs> and only a few individuals remain that homozygote recessives become sufficiently frequent for selection to result in a change route. So the idea is that there, are, there is standing genetic variation in populations that will only be expressed when in a, a homozygote state. If you reduce the population size, there will be more homozygotes and then that can lead to fast evolution of behavior. That's what we will test in the future. Now, the second part, which I'll, I'll be brief, um, is going again to the fork-tail flycatcher, this point in which they dropped migration and that led to geographic isolation. So the question that I have is whether geographic isolation is necessary. And I'm gonna change the scale here. We're gonna look at the whole 900 species that have migratory and non-migratory populations. And we're gonna see uh, how this are, this, these populations are distributed. So there are many flavors <laughs> of um, these distributions. Here's a Philoscopus warbler for Trevor. <laughs> um, there's some species that uh, have populations that breed in the same area, and then some individuals migrate and others stay, but they are sympatrically breeding. There's populations where you have the non-migratory birds, this is like the forktail flycatcher, um, breeding in an area separated, geographically separated from the breeding area of the migratory birds. And then there's some birds that have a continuous distribution where you have migrants breeding uh, next to each other to non-migrants. And so this project is also with my uh, postdoc advisor, um, David Tefs, Ben Winger at the University of Michigan, and then Elkin is uh, a friend that I met in Daniel's lab. Um, we collaborate and we help each other very much. So uh, yeah, your lab mates can be your colleagues uh, for the rest of your career. Um, okay, so what I'm showing here is all the breeding distributions of uh, migratory in blue, and then non-migratory uh, populations of those 900 species that have variation. And then what you see in red is where populations overlap. And what you can see is that there is a lot of overlap uh, in, those, uh, in, in these areas 
where there's changes between seasonal environments to less seasonal environments. Uh, and it seems to be more consistent with population expansions at the community level rather than population drop-offs, as we saw with the four-tailed flycatch. This is um, a, a, a graph from a paper from one of Trevor's um, doctoral students, uh, where they look at um, biogeographic regions of birds. And one thing that came up is that the freezing line, which is this point in which the mean minimum temperature of the coldest month is zero, seems to be very important for bird distributions. And so when I saw this graph, I thought, well, this is incredible. This is exactly what we're finding with our, with our migratory and non-migratory populations. What you have here is the number of species that have a migratory or a non-migratory population across latitude in the y-axis. And the point in which the peaks of those uh, two behaviors intersect is exactly the freezing line. So this might not be that surprising of course, we think climate affects migration. I just didn't think it was gonna be so clean. Um, and also it's very, it, it, it is a common across all these different species from different parts of the phylogeny. And so what you can see here are all the points of migratory and non-migratory populations. And you can see that they um, occupy different uh, climatic uh, spaces. So in terms of temperate seasonality, but uh, temperature seasonality, but not on precipitation. So I was very excited. I thought, okay, we can do maybe a, um, um, a model in which we can know what is the probability of uh, expressing the behavior with different, uh, with changes in, in climate. Um, so this is a logistic regression with our data. Uh, and we can see that we can have um, a curve in which we can predict whether they will express migration or not. Um, not so the case with precipitation. And then thinking about, okay, in the what can we predict in the future what will happen to migration? Um, and then when we look, this graph is like, not showing very well, but when we look at each single species, the trend, the general trend is that it follows that line, but it, there is some variability. And there are some species that don't follow that line, a few of them. So there is also likely some ecological factors that are species specific that need to be integrated into these models to understand what will happen to migration. So with that, I want to end, I want to say that switching migratory strategies appears to be a powerful and underappreciated mechanism that has led, uh, contributed to the diversity of species. Here I show you with birds, but migration, as I showed at the beginning, um, is found across animals. And so, yeah, just integrating different aspects of biology um, to understand uh, this question of whether the role of behavior, what is the role of behavior in the origin of species? And so I want to invite any student. There's many things to do, a lot of data, a lot of ideas. If you want to work with me, um, I'm open to hearing your ideas. Whew. Thank you. Thank you, Amaury and Natasha and everyone. Voy a hacerle en español. Sí, listo. Es que hace poquito leí un artículo sobre unos swallows que decía que debido a que ponen los nidos debajo de estos puentes de autopistas, pues que muchos eran estrellados y que entonces la selección estaba favoreciendo a aquellos que tenían alitas más cortas, dado que les permitía moverse mucho más fácil. Pero entonces eso se ve reflejado en la migración, porque alas más cortas también afectan patrones migratorios. Eh, no sé si esto te puede hacer surgir más preguntas. Digamos que mi pregunta principal fue como, ¿en qué, o sea, están cogiendo todas las poblaciones o específicamente de ciudades o de... 
o como de zonas no alteradas por los humanos, o bueno, sí, como que hacia vaya la pregunta. Thank you, that's a great question. So the, the question was uh, that she mentioned she read uh, somewhere about swallows that breeding in, in under bridges sort of like has led to selection affecting them because they get struck by cars. Uh, so now they have uh, like more rounded wings so they can maneuver better. Um, and so if that could change uh, or made me think about some some things with the research on the swallows. Uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, we're finding, so you also asked where, where we were sampling swallows, right? So um, we are, uh, we have plans of studying the morphology. Of course, the flight morphology is one of the, the, the first things. These birds are um, like an iconic model for aerodynamics, uh, but definitely like things like that could be affecting them. I have never seen one struck by a car. I've seen four tail flight catchers struck by a car, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> uh, I was in the car with my collaborator. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it was very sad, but <laughs> Uh, I it would definitely we, we will uh, we will see what happens with morphology. There is evidence that shorter migration distances also reflect on uh, wing morphology. Our sampling is the across rural areas and I think in in like in in the cities like in Buenos Aires, it's it's not present. It's more on the outer skirts of the city, right? Like more more rural uh, kind of things. But yeah, so swallows have a. a an advantage with human-made structures because they have where to nest. But then, um, as it's likely happening, is in northern, uh, in eastern North America, some aspects of human uh, development affect them because they forage on insects. They're insectivorous, aerial insectivorous, and with uh, agriculture, this probably is affecting them. So they have like this dual relationship with humans where there is something about us that helps them and then something that likely is affecting them now. Well, thank you very much, everyone. We're just going to thank Valentina for a wonderful talk. Um, <laughs> okay. We're going to have a little break for coffee. And then we're gonna come back promptly for at 45, like, uh, what is it, 11.45 now? Uh, so that we can finish the last part of the symposium and our speakers don't get too hungry after that. <laughs> Ya está aprendido.
A la salida. Sí, es que le tocó irse para que no se le quede la gente de la vida. Pero que si no se le daba en media hora, le quitaba la vida. Con bote, pero como es pues, está todo un poco caótico. Entonces, yo creo que voy a presentarlo. ¿Con qué? ¿Con qué? ¿Qué device hablo? ¿Listo? Well, welcome to the final stretch of the symposium. I hope everyone is having fun and is well caffeinated for this last bit. Um, so we have the next talk. I'm very excited to introduce Roberto Marquez. Roberto arrived in Chicago. We overlapped for, for I think, a year when I was finishing my PhD. Um, I, I was actually very pregnant and, and it was the last year. Everything was very chaotic. And um, I met Roberto because he was one of the first students for Marcus Kronforst at U Chicago, where he did his PhD. And I thought he was the bravest person I know because he established a whole new system. He brought his own frogs to do his PhD in Chicago and he was amazing, like everything he did to establish this system. Um, obviously he did a wonderful thesis and then moved on to a start a postdoc where he is right now at the University of Michigan. Um, and today he's gonna tell us about all of this molecular genetics work he's done on, on, the, on the frogs that he studied. So welcome and thank you so much. Bueno, eh, primero gracias a todos los que organizaron y por invitarme, igual que Valentina, preguntas en español se valen. Um, and yeah, I guess I, I should tell you about the work I've been doing on poison frog genetics, especially with regards to hyposemitism. And I guess instead of that big boring title, my talk should be called How Do You Make a Poison Frog? Um, really interested in understanding how these phenotypes that we see in these species have evolved through, you know, how and why, basically. <clears throat> so before I start, as Natasha said, this has been a huge amount of work where we've kind of tried to establish a new system to study phenotypic evolution. And this is impossible without a team of amazing people, many of whom are here. So I wanted to, first off, just acknowledge that I've received a lot of help from colleagues, mentors, and now more recently students who have done a lot of the work that I'm gonna show here. And so, yeah, this is a very collaborative project. And I guess, as I told you, I'm really interested in phenotypic diversity and where it comes from. And when we wanna understand how different phenotypes evolve and why we see the diversity that we see today, I think, a very productive way to reduce this into a single question is asking what happened, right? Along the history of a set of lineages, what happened that resulted in them looking different in our particular trait of interest? And this question can be divided into three sub-questions, which I think help kind of unravel what's going on. The first one is the what's, when, where's, right? What is the history of things? What actually happened, I guess? What story do we tell as a sequence of events? Then the how, which is, you know, within the organism, what changes in its genome and its interactions with the environment actually lead to the phenotypic differences that we see. And finally, the whys, which allude more to the selective pressures and the general ecology and natural history of species that end up favoring some of these changes and allowing them to perpetuate themselves through the history of a particular lineage. And oops, as Natasha said the main character here are poison dart frogs, specifically the genus Phyllobates, which are the true poison dart frogs because they are the species actually used to poison dart tips here in Colombia. They live in Western Colombia and Southern Central America, distributed along all the Chocoan wet forests up to about 800 to 1,000 meters, although Daniel might be doubting me at this point. Um, <coughs> And I guess the most interesting aspect of this system, at least for now to me, is that we can divide their color patterns into two camps. We have the dark species with a col uh, brightly colored dorsolateral stripe, and then we have 
these two yellow species, which are also bigger in terms of body size and presumably more toxic, although that remains to be seen. Um, and a very cool feature about coloration here uh, can be seen when we look at development. So these species all have very strong paternal care. Dads carry tadpoles on their back from where they hatch into the water. And in the water, regardless of the species, the tadpoles will develop a dorsolateral stripe around metamorphosis, which is the time when most amphibians develop their adult coloration. However, in the yellow species, something really cool happens, which is that post-metamorphically, <clears throat> as froglets develop into juveniles, they start gradually losing dark pigmentation until they become solid yellow frogs. And this is actually very rare to see in an amphibian having such drastic post-metamorphic color change. And this happens in all the yellow species that we know of. And back, you know, in the 70s, when we were starting to, or we not, not we, because I wasn't even alive, but when people were starting to figure out the phylogenetic relationships between species in a more formal way, this was actually used as the textbook example where you had a trait that you had evidence beyond phylogenetics to polarize the direction of change. And so this was your toy system to say you use traits that are informed biologically and here's how you build trees. And so these two big yellow species were considered sister species for a long time. However, my own and other people's work has shown that this is definitely not the case when we use molecular markers. And so it seems that not only there aren't two but three solid yellow lineages, but none of them are sister to another yellow lineage, which hints at a very dynamic evolution of coloration in this system in the last couple million years, which is pretty fast in evolutionary terms. Another cool thing of this system, if you look at the map here, is that the three yellow lineages are actually separate from one another. And these two look very close together, but right in the middle here is Tatama, which many of you know is a very tall mountain that we have very strong evidence that these frogs can't climb. So operationally, we basically have three phylogenetically separate and geographically separate lineages that look very different from what we think was the ancestral state. And so over the past decade, I've been really, really interested in understanding how and why did this happen in this particular system. And so you might be guessing that I think about this in the three axes that I mentioned at the beginning, thinking about the history, the within organism mechanisms, and of course the natural history and ecology that has led to that existing. And so in this talk, I'm just gonna go over each one of these axes and my ongoing work to try to tell you what I think is going on in this system, at least for now. So by, by geographically, as I was telling you, we have a very dynamic phylogenetic pattern at least. And so here, what I'm interested in, in understanding is what actually happened that led to these phylogenetically and geographically disjunct distributions of coloration. And a very useful lens through which to look at this, which was actually suggested by Trevor, since this is Trevor Fest, is thinking about this in terms of gene flow in space, right? So when we have a system that is relatively occupying the same space, and it's a space that species can presumably travel through, gene flow can have different effects depending on how it works on uh, phenotypic diversification. For example, reduced gene flow between populations of different phenotypes can actually help them establish as populations of different phenotypes. But also gene flow between populations can lead to them having the same phenotype through the movement of the alleles that code for those phenotypes or if there is too much gene flow that might hinder diversification by keeping things homogeneous. And so if we understand how gene flow is working among the lineages in question, we might be able to say some things about what actually happened. And so to, oh, that you can't really see anything, but well, to <laughs> summarize a lot of work in understanding the gene flow in the system, what I've been doing is using spatial population genetics where we think not about lineages but at places in a map and try to reconstruct whether there is more or less gene flow than we expect in these places and you're going to have to trust me like absolutely entirely here uh, 
but basically we've reconstructed places where we think there are barriers to gene flow. For example, Tatama, here you can see a very small hint of orange, which would be an area where we think there is less movement of alleles through the map. Um, and I guess to make a long story short, we have found that there is a very strong signal for a corridor of gene flow along the San Juan River, which makes sense when we think about this. Historically, the San Juan River has been a bit of stable forest throughout the Pleistocene glaciations, especially in terms of ocean introgressions that have made a lot of this mangroves or wet forests over the past million years. <clears throat> and the cool thing about this gene flow corridor, which you have to believe me, joins these species, is that it's mainly connecting lineages that are striped, but that are not sisters in the phylogeny, except for one case where we find this phylobates bicolor population showing an important uh, amount of gene flow with its closely related striped populations. So basically, there seems to be a lot of striped populations that are connected by gene flow in one case where the different phenotypes seem to be exchanging alleles as well. However, we might also want to ask how about these episodic long range migrations, right? We might have these instances of convergent evolution appearing that way on a tree because the species are cheating their history and through some sort of migration, swapping out the alleles that give them these particular colorations. And so again, we've tried to reconstruct, given a population's position, how much of its genome comes from places that are too far away for this to just be diffusion of alleles over space. Uh, and these histograms there show for each one of these points, the proportion of the genome that we think came from far away. And I can get into the details of this later on. And it's basically always zero, right? And we've done several iterations of this to actually test that. And I think there is 10,000 times more support for gene flow across long distances being zero than for it existing. So we're pretty sure, I think, that what is going on here is that there is a considerable amount of short range gene flow, mostly between populations that are in this kind of central area, which are also striped. Whereas there seems to be reduced gene flow towards two of the solid yellow populations, which are in the periphery. And so this could hint that perhaps this reduced gene flow is allowing these populations to evolve into something different. However, we find a very interesting uh, situation where this doesn't happen, right? We have this particular case where there seems to be a lot of genetic exchange between a yellow and a striped population. And so I've then gone and focused on that particular place to see what's going on and see if we can inform ourselves a little more. And so <clears throat> if you actually go there, which Daniel and I did for months and months of my PhD, um, you can see that there is actually a gradual transition between these solid yellow and these striped populations, which occurs in an elevational gradient along the San Juan River. Mm. And so understanding what processes are behind this transition that we see in macroscopic phenotypes just by looking at it can tell us a lot about what is going on here and especially what might be happening in the future, right? Are these two just becoming homogenized because they were separate in the past? Is this actually budding away from this striped system and we're catching some sort of smoking gun situation that can be super informative? And so recently with my student Kyle, we have been trying to understand what's going on here from both historical and present perspectives. So for example, using again, uh, many markers across the genome, we have re reconstructed that in the recent past, there has been a range expansion from the lowlands up to the highlands. And we can do this by measuring the amount of genetic drift that we observe in each of these populations. Again, I can get into the details later. I would be very happy to. Uh, and we have very strong evidence that recently, frogs have climbed up the mountain. And this makes sense. This is the only montane species of phylobates that we know. And when we look at how things stand now at the actual pattern of change in phenotypes and genotypes, we always see a very smooth gradual transition here. I'm showing coloration, but we've looked at several body size and bioacoustic uh, traits, and they all show pretty much the same. When we look at genetics, especially focusing on the genetic variants that are very differentiated between 
the ends of this client, so the ones that we would expect to tell the most strong side of the story, we still find a lot of discordance here. You should be seeing a lot of gray lines that show many different patterns. And if we average across all these genes, we find again a very smooth transition down this line. And so this to me, oh, and we have also uh, asked the question whether there has been suitable habitat throughout the history of this here. This is important because if there has been a very dry period here, this might have ended up separating these two lineages. And so that might tell us why here in the middle we're finding these admixed individuals. And looking at predictions of how climate looked like in the past, back to the last glacial maximum, we've always found that there has been either as much or more suitable habitat across the system for poison frogs to exist. So we think at least the opportunity for gene flow has been there throughout. And so we think this system seems to be an ongoing case of peripatric divergence where we have these two lineages that are currently separating into two different phenotypes. And of course, some of you who have actually worked on the theory behind this might know this is very difficult to test. But for now, we are treating this as a case of peripatric divergence where we might actually be seeing things happen right now, of course, slowly, but so where I'm really excited to keep working and trying to see what is actually promoting this divergence to happen. And so I guess from these two stories that I've told you about biogeography, what seems to, happen, to be happening here is that we have apparently actual convergent evolution in the face of gene flow and perhaps despite gene flow, right? So at least in this case of the client that I was showing you, there seems to be diversification despite gene flow, which would have a homogenizing effect. And that to me suggests that there is importance here for adaptation and natural history. And that what we're seeing is not just a product of the history of these lineages, but actual evolution of the phenotypes due to their ecology. <clears throat> and of course, what is the ecology and natural history? This was actually the first question I ever asked about this system when I was an undergrad here. What do predation pressures even look like for these morphs in different places? And so back when I had to plan my undergrad thesis, I decided to build an army of little wax frogs and then convince all the graduate students in the lab where I was working not to do their own thesis, but to paint little frogs with me. And we took all these models painted different colors to a particular place where we thought we could test whether there were differential predation pressures between the colorations. We even took a camera trap, which was really cool back in 2011, and we put it by our little models, and we were sure we were going to solve this system in six months. And then we caught one predator, which was an opossum, which you can see here, stealing my models at night, honestly, to just lick the salt in the paints or something. So that thesis definitely didn't go through. And that is why I ended up doing evolutionary genetics, because I still had to graduate. And so 12 years later, here I am. Uh, however, my colleague Francesca Proti, who was at the University of Costa Rica at the time, actually did do this experiment more rigorously. Where this species Phallobates vitatis exists, uh, she found that these models that are fully orange, so this would be homologous to the solid yellow species that we see right now, do actually get attacked a lot more, especially by lizards, which we think are a feasible predator of poison frogs. And so at least in this one site in Costa Rica, we have pretty decent evidence that predation pressures are probably important in this system. However, I'm super keen to go back to the field and perhaps test this in a more generalized way. In the meantime, however, I've been working in understanding also the mechanisms within the frog that lead to these differences in coloration that we observe, and especially the changes at the genome level that have led to the evolutionary change that we think happened. <clears throat> and so here, I'm asking how convergent is this, right? What is the mechanism that leads to convergent evolution? Convergent evolution at a phenotype can happen in many different ways, right? Especially at a macroscopic phenotype like the one we're seeing here. We could have, for example, these two balls that became red do so by accumulating two very different pigments that are red that occur through different pathways and are acquired by food in some cases or produced by the organism in others. 
we could also modify different genes in the same general pathway, which we see in melanic phenotypes, a bunch you get albinos through breaking any one of these genes in the pathway that creates melanin. And you can go down the ladder of biological organization all the way to the same mutation from the same ancestral state in both lineages leading to the exact same phenotype. So I'm very interested in understanding where in this continuum the poison frogs lie. And so what I'm going to do in the last minutes of this talk is basically go down the levels of biological organization to try to see where we would stop considering this convergent evolution, I guess, in its traditional sense. And so if we look at development, as I told you, this happens after metamorphosis and seems to be very similar, at least at the macroscopic level, between the two yellow species that we can breed in the lab. The timings appear to be very similar, at least the timing to this stage is remarkably similar in lab conditions, I'm trying to recruit someone to actually compare the trajectories of color change over development to see how similar they are. But development seems to be pretty similar at the macroscopic level. Now, if we go down to the pigment cells, the colors that we see results from the organization of different types of pigment cells in the skin. And so in frogs and fish, how this works is we have three broad categories of pigment cells that are stacked in these little towers. And so their stacking determines the color that a particular piece of skin shows. So at the bottom, we have the melanin cells called melanophores, which are very big and at the bottom, but also have these tentacles that go to the top of the stacks and melanin can travel through those tentacles. For example, that's how humans tan when we hit, when we get hit by UV light. Melanin just travels from your dermis to your epidermis and that's why your skin looks a little darker. After melanophores going up, we have these big chunky cells called iridophores, which contain microcrystals, usually of guanine that bend light in all sorts of funky ways to create blues and metallic yellows like we see in poison frogs. And at the top, we have these cells called xanthophores, which contain carotenoids and other yellow, orange, red pigments. <clears throat> and so it's the combination of these cells again that gives a particular color. So if we look at this frog there and ask my student Aliyah to take uh, histological sections of different parts of its skin, we can see here, for example, at this orange bit that this should look yellow, but there is this thick layer that contains xanthophores and iridophores, which we think is making the yellow, but we still see melanin at the bottom. However, we don't see the melanin from the outside because it is underneath this very thick layer of orange cells. If we look at the center of the frog, which is very dark, we now see that the melanin extends all the way to the epidermis, and that is why we see it. Whether, it's, whether these cells are there or not, or there's just melanin covering them through these tentacles, we don't know. We're trying to do electron microscopy to figure that out. But in any case, it's very distinguishable, the, the phenotype of these, the cellular phenotype of these two patches of skin. And so if we put this on our tree, we can see that the periphery or where the stripe would be in the yellow species looks very similar. We always see this thick layer of what I'm calling yellow or orange cells. <clears throat> and when we look at the middle in the dark species, we again see melanin all the way to the epidermis, which makes sense. However, when we look at the two yellow species, it looks very similar to where the stripe used to be. And it also looks very similar between the two yellow species. So at least at the cellular level from these histological techniques, it does seem to be very convergent at this level as well. <clears throat> if we mix these two levels and look at what's going on through development, it seems like the melanin is slowly moving away and giving way for these orange cells. And how I think this is happening is through these tentacles that I've been mentioning, the granules of melanin just move down microtubules to the center of the cell. And that's why we see here, for example, melanin up to the dermis, but then in this region, which is from this frog that is all patchy, we see the melanin way lower in the skin. And so I think this is at the cellular level, a change in movement of melanin granules within cells, but this of course remains to be evaluated. So again, at the pigment cell level, the, this does seem to be convergent. And now if we go down to the genetic level, we can get convergence in three ways, basically. One is what I guess we would call, you know, full on convergence, different mutations and different lineages leading to the same phenotype. And then we can have these instances of convergence where either 
we have pre-existing variants that get independently selected uh, to rise in frequency and produce some phenotype that is very similar, or where species through gene flow kind of swap out the particular alleles. And so this looks like convergence, but from a genetic level, this is one origin and not too much of a independent selection, rather some sort of co-selection between species. <clears throat> and so of course we need to find out what the genes involved are, which I've been trying to do for a while. But for this, we also need a reference genome. And so I thought the frog genomics folks were gonna be in the room, but so we've tried to do a reference genome for one of our species. And this has been super tough. We have thrown all the technologies you might think of. And if you are into genome assembly or not, you might realize that a genome in 600,000 pieces is perhaps not the most complete uh, genome assembly of all. And while we were doing this project, we were also working on a separate genome assembly where we discovered that actually poison frog genomes are 70% transposable elements. And this is probably the cause of all of our misery. Uh, I try to explain why this is to my mom by saying, imagine you're building a jigsaw puzzle and 70% of the pieces are the sky. And so you know, it's basically very difficult to put together a genome where 70% of the bits are in more than one place of the genome. Technology is improving. We think we're going to nail this down in the next five years. Uh, however, we can still use our super fragmented assembly and see what we find. And so I've again been using the geographic and phylogenetic sort of repeatedness of the system to my advantage to do this by looking at closely related species with different phenotypes and trying to find regions of the genome that are very different between them, which is where we would expect the genes involved in their phenotypic differences to be. <clears throat> and so to summarize four years of my life in one slide, we have you know, as you would when you compare any two populations, we have found several outliers, outlier regions within which we find a few genes for which I could make up a story about them being involved in coloration, either through the specification of cell lineages that end up in pigment cells or through this process of melanin movement within cells. And of course, we don't know what these genes are doing in poison frogs, but if we assume that they are behind coloration for a minute, the really interesting thing is that in these two lineages, we find completely non-overlapping sets of genes. So this hints to a very independent sort of evolution here, where it's evolution at different genes causing very similar phenotypes. However, to really nail this down, we need to look at the history of alleles at these loci. And we do this by building trees of these loci. This is a really messy figure, and that is perhaps the point of it. We never find cases where this purple and blue uh, tips, which are the two solid yellow species, are sister of each other. So again, this points to at least at these genes, these frogs not sharing any similar alleles, which in my view rules out the introgression idea. The other two are more difficult to rule out and we're still working on this. Uh, but you know, I think the key here is understanding what these genes do in poison frogs. And so for a while, I have been working with my two colleagues at Sanford and Illinois, Lauren O'Connell and Eva Fisher, to try to transfer all these fantastic genome editing, gene modification, gene expression modification tools from other systems into poison frogs to make this system a much more amenable system for lab work because they're a really cool system for field work. And so we wanna make the ultimate complete system to study integrative biology. And so my role in this project has been trying to nail down CRISPR knockouts and hopefully more stuff in the future. And very recently with my students, Chris, and so we've actually been able to knock out a gene involved in melanization in poison frogs. So if we inject some eggs and sequence that gene, you can maybe see that the sequencer output is a mess, which tells us we have cut the sequence there in many weird, unpredictable ways. And if we look at the tadpoles that come out of those eggs, you can see their eyes have much less black pigmentation than their sibling, which was not injected with anything. Uh, however, once they do metamorphosis is when we really kind of prove that we have knocked out a pigmentation gene. This frog definitely cannot make melanin in a lot of parts of its body. So 
this particular gene is not one of our candidates, but it is super exciting that we can transfer many of these genome editing tools into poison frogs to understand what changes in what genes are actually responsible for the phenotypes that we see in the present. And so with that, I want to kind of summarize what the story is that I'm telling you. I've shown you what seems to be pretty independent origins of very similar phenotypes, sometimes in the face of gene flow. And so I think this, again, just reiterates that the history here is really not imposing too much contingency in the phenotypic diversification of the system, but rather this seems to be some sort of adaptation, perhaps to predation pressures or other stuff. And so since we're just starting to pull together this system, I wanted to mention for a second some of the future directions that I'm taking. <clears throat> I'm very interested in not only understanding coloration, but also other traits that are associated to coloration, like toxicity and body size, which we think make up this kind of multimodal phenotype of predator avoidance and how the genetic architecture be underlying these phenotypes helps these correlated suites of traits evolve together that quickly. I'm also interested in toxicity itself here. These are the most toxic animals in the world, according to Animal Planet. How don't they die with such potent toxins? And finally, I am very interested in making this a system where we can ask all the questions from all the points of view and try to integrate them into a single system so that we can really, really understand the evolution of one group. And so I put a lot of work into developing tools like genome editing or like more creative phenotyping approaches like CT scanning to really try to use these frogs in every possible way. And so, of course, this requires, and oh, and last thing, of course, always back to the field, the natural history is the inspiration for everything. But so this requires a lot of minds and a lot of expertise and a lot of perspectives. So I am always looking for people from students to emeritus professors and everything in between to join me in this crazy idea of making poison frogs the best system ever. So if you're interested, you can hit me up. With that, I want to thank all my collaborators and the money people, plus the ones that I go to when I don't understand anything. And I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> Roberto, la idea que, no, en español, la idea que Ofaga y Filobates compartían los mismos patrones de, de distribución del Pacífico, al menos el Pacífico Norte, era muy bonita porque permitía explicar eh, los, mor, eh, los morfotipos de histriónica. ¿no? Entonces, pues el Baudó como una fuente, el norte del Chocó otra, el sur del Chocó otra, pegaba la placa de Panamá y lo separaba, listo. En el Bajo San Juan, no, en, el, en, el, en las tierras bajas de ahí del San Juan, del Alto San Juan, pues uno encuentra mezclas histriónicas de todo lado, entonces encajaba muy bien. Pero si ahora me dices que, que los modelos indican que había hábitat apropiado para las especies durante tanto tiempo, ¿por qué pareciera que los mecanismos de distribución de filobates no coinciden con los de Ofaga? Es lo contrario, ¿no? Entonces, ¿por qué? Okay, so to repeat the question in English for a sec. Uh... Daniel knows more about poison frog distributions in Colombia than anyone in the world, and I'll put my hands on fire over that. And so his question is about other poison frog lineages that have similar distributions in similar places where we find these intermediate morphs, but in this particular case, it's within species. And so the question is, if there are idea that we had discussed a bunch in the past was through the fluctuations of the Pleistocene, these morphs got kind of trapped in mountaintops and in the lowlands we see these intermediate forms. If we have found that there is, at least in this one elevational gradient, relatively suitable habitat over the past at least 100,000 years, but probably throughout the whole fluctuations of the Pleistocene, where does that idea land? And I think, I don't know, and that system is super complicated, but really interesting to study. It's a different genus of poison frogs. I think my answer to that for now would be this, this is suitable habitat for phylobates, which, you know, might have slightly different requirements than other, you know, different poison frogs that are 20 million years away. And also, 
it could also be that there has been suitable habitat and perhaps it's not isolation because of geography or climate that has brought them apart and then brought them back together. There might just be something different going on on top of the mountains that selects for particular different morphs and in the middle is just where they meet because they can be there. And so there's just gene flow happening because nothing is stopping them from interbreeding. Of course, this needs to be super studied, but I don't think finding that gene flow can have happened throughout the history of the system changes the idea that the mountaintops are these places where we find pure morphs and then that and they then interbreed at the lowlands to create all these funky morphs that we see. Yeah. Um, so I was curious about your guess regarding, so you have three independent regions, right? And all of them are both, uh, so they have the coloration and toxicity occurring together. So do you have any guess on whether there will be some sort of master gene involved in this repeated evolution or will your guess will be more about the clustering of like loci that will lead to similar phenotypes? Right. Um, so quick answer, I'll tell you in about 10 years. Um, you can, there are many ways, right? You could think about inversions and stuff like that, like you were talking about this sort of super gene idea. I think this can have to do with the fact that pigment cells and body size, and I'll connect this to toxicity in a minute, start happening through basically cell proliferation in the neural crest. Some of the genes that we have found associated with coloration are very well studied, for example, in terms of cancer and organ growth and basically cell cycle regulation. So there is, you know, you can make up a story about pleiotropy here. I have looked at the hybrid individuals of so these admixed individuals in these hybrid zones. And even there, the correlation between body size and coloration is pretty strong. You would expect these admixed individuals to have broken up associations that aren't genetic, right? Either through linkage or through pleiotropy. Um, and this links to toxicity because poison glands develop during growth, right? During puberty, if, if you want to call, you know, during the period before sexual maturation. And so one could go, you know, all the way Stephen Jay Gould and say, this is just an extension of the period of growth that leads to an overdevelopment of coloration that ends up in bigger frogs, more poison glands. But this is what I would have answered like at a committee meeting. I don't have any like Yeah, just a guess. Evidence. That's that's fine. But Thank it's, you. <laughs> it's a working hypothesis for the not correlational selection only scenario. Thanks. Yeah. 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 This is gonna can I ask a very quick question? Sure. So if being a bright yellow frog increases predation, which sounds reasonable, can you speculate on what the benefit of being bright yellow is? Uh, it could increase predation, but it also increases memorability. And if you have an insane amount of toxins in your skin, I'm sure that snake is going to remember that the yellow one makes you feel terrible. Um, but yeah, that, that is the explanation, I guess. Hello. Okay, moving on, our, our next speaker is uh, Felipe Diaz. Uh, Felipe did his uh, undergrad here at Uniandes and now is a master's student in uh, our lab. Um, he has done some forays into working with primates and things like that, but I'd say he's crazy about hummingbirds. He studied the role of uh, the influence of molt on hummingbird aerodynamics for his uh, undergrad and now He's studying a really interesting system in which there's a polymorphism in females that varies geographically in a lineage of Andean hummingbirds. And that's what they'll be presenting today. Very preliminary, but very exciting. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Uh, I want to begin with my presentation asking you something. Please imagine uh, really quick a peacock or a pavo real. What's the first image that comes to your mind? I bet most of you thought on something similar to this, but did anyone think on this other bird? Well, this not that pretty bird is actually the female of the peacock, 
and as you might see, is not as ornamented as male as the male. Is this the general trend? Like, are always the males prettier than females? Let's say that in general, that's the case. Uh, females of several species, uh, well, biologists of uh, have tried to say why is that males of several species present secondary sexual traits such as ornaments. And actually, the sexual selection theory arose uh, to response to this doubt. But what about females? Well, females are thought to present dual phenotypes with might be advantages under natural selection framework, frameworks. Uh, but this is not always the case. There are several examples where females might show ornaments or, well, yeah, they can be beautiful too. But why is that? Why is that females can express similar traits to those on males? There are possible explanations. Males and females share most, most of their genomes, so it's not surprising that they also show similar traits. But there are other instances that can trigger the evolution of ornaments in females, such as direct selection upon females, where they compete uh, against each other for resources or, in some cases, for mates. Or in non-sexual social selection scenarios, where females are, can be similar to males to prevent social harassment. When we're talking about sexual selection, birds are a great model of a study given their high diversity and because they are, let's say, accessible. And within birds, hummingbirds are a great target of a study given that they are, well, they're beautiful, they are really diverse, and their uh, social system is strictly polygenous. Here I just picked a few examples of a male hummingbird that I consider really beautiful and ornamented. But across hummingbirds, there are females that are ornamented as well. So in a, in, in a polygenous system like, on the system, um, hum, like in hummingbirds, uh, being colorful might be useful or to express dominance in, and in these cases uh, defend resources. And if hummingbirds are in interesting enough, there's something, like, and a strange phenomenon going on uh, in, their, in their clade. And it's this thing of sex-limited polymorphism in which just one sex differ or have different morphs. And this is the case of the uh, white-necked Jacobin in which some females can show the male-like phenotype and others do not. And this has been associated that uh, male-like females uh, have less aggression uh, than the ones that are typical females. So this is another way in which uh, ornaments or colorful plumages can evolve. And as I told you, this thing of the sex limited polymorphism seems to be widespread across the hummingbirds club, uh, cl uh, clade. And so let's go back in time. In uh, the beginning of the last century, the American Museum of Natural History came here and conducted some uh, field trips. And in 1917, Frank Chapman described that some females of this species, the terminal angel, uh, express the pinkish iridescent feathers of males. Later, in the 80s, Robert, uh, Robert Blyweiss uh, redescribed this sex-limited polymorphism and classified females into four different categories, depending of the, on the number of iridescent feathers they presented, going from category one that had typical females to category four that had completely made like females. The intermediate states between these two vary depending on the number of iridescent feeders. And even more interesting is that he found that there is some geographic variation in the polymorphism. Let me explain to you. The two populations of the northern part of the central and eastern Andes, those females can show either of the four categories of the polymorphism, going from females of category one, to category four and the intermediate states in between. Now, as you go down to the southern part of Colombia, females there can only be of uh, category one or category four. There are no intermediate morphs uh, between these two. And finally, once you go uh, to Ecuador, the polymorphism does not exist. Just typical females can be found there. So this weird pattern uh, make us think a lot of questions. Uh, one of them is that, as you can see, the two populations that are 
uh, presenting the whole palette of variation of the polymorphism are located at opposite sides of the mountain range. Here, the uh, po populations of the central Andes and populations of the eastern Andes show the same phenotypic pattern. How is that those two populations show the same variation in the phenotype? So we propose two different scenarios. First, well, those two populations might be showing the same phenotypic pattern because they come from a common reason ancestor. The other possibility might be uh, that those two populations independently evolve the same phenotypic variation via convergent evolution. How are we going to test this? Uh, we're going to perform sort of phylogenetic assessment to see how the uh, relationships across populations are distributed. The other inferent, interesting thing about this uh, sex-limited polymorphism is that, as I told you, uh, there's a variation from north to south and in populations that occur in the same Andean range. So, for example, in this uh, population of, of the central Andes, you can find the four population, the four uh, categories of phenotype, but as, the, as you go down to southern Colombia, you can also see uh, you can only see the two uh, category one or category four and as you go down to ecuador the polymorphism does not exist so what evolutionary forces causes this differential expression of the sex limited polymorphism in the populations that occur in the same mountain range we again propose two different scenarios one of it is maybe assuming that populations are isolated if so uh, maybe different shell uh, selective pressures or uh, stochastic processes might be triggering uh, the differentiation of this polymorphism. The other possibility is by taking into account that the distribution of this species is continuous across the Andes, and so gene flow might be occurring. In these cases, maybe natural selection uh, differences across populations uh, within each population might be counteracting the homogenizing effect of gene flow and so populations can uh, differentiate from each other how are we going to test this uh, we're conducting well a genomic by a genomic approach of genetic structure to see if we can find different uh, different uh, genetic clusters across populations and to see if there's any sign of admixture between populations but first, what I just told you, all this phenotypic variation was described in the 80s, since blaze wise, uh, there's no, there hasn't been studies uh, over this species, so the phenotypic variation hasn't been clearly understood. So that's our first objective to see if what blade was said was okay or not. To do so, we base our analysis using museum specimens and some uh, field trips to collect some uh, some more individuals and take a, and we took two different complementary approaches, one by using a spectrophotometry and the other a pattern based analysis with digital photographs. So for the spectral analysis, we took reflectance from individual feeders of five different patches, the gorget, the crown, the rump, the belly and the upper part that let's call it mantle. So we took the, and measured the reflectance and color descriptors for, all, for each of those patches and compare it between sexes and between populations. For the analysis of, uh, pa for the pattern based analysis, we took the digital photographs and those photographs, we extracted the, the colors and plot them into a color PCA to see which uh, individuals uh, are similar between each other and like plot all the variation uh, in a color PCA. Now, what have we found so far? Uh, in terms of color space, well, you can see it so well, but males and females share most of their colors. But when looking in detail to the color descriptor that are hue, brightness, and chroma, uh, they differ in three in three of the patches, in the belly, rump, and in the mantle. So females have higher values of chroma uh, in these three patches. These three patches have been associated to be under natural selection framework. Given that gorget and crown are like the bright, the bright and colorful patches that uh, are associated to sexual selection, given the behavior, behavioral interactions 
between individuals. Now, this was between males and females, but what is going on across populations? We found no difference between uh, populations, so they are basically spectrally undistinguishable. Now, when looking at the pattern-based analysis here in the PCA, uh, like uh, to the left, the proportion of pink colors and here white colors, and the PC2 is like how intense the color is, going from really intense, like really bright colors, and here the duller colors. But let's just take into account this PCA. What can we see is that uh, females have like, a, or occupy a bigger span of the color space given their variation in the polymorphism and males only differ into in the intensity of the color that might be explained by uh, the lighting, lighting conditions or how the feeders are organized during the preparation now when seeing just the females across populations we saw that there is not a really uh, distinguishable pattern the only thing that uh, corresponds to what Blaise was says is that Ecuadorian females cluster into one group that has no iridescence and that the Western populations that you can see it very well but you have to trust me uh, all the females that we uh, measure had at least some degree of iridescence but to better understand this basically the pattern is similar to this so in populations in Colombia you can find uh, females from all different for categories, but once you go to Ecuador, the polymorphism does not exist. So there's no discrete variation in the southern part of Colombia. And these results make me think a lot, I have not answered yet, of what's going on, but uh, maybe by doing the genetics we can solve this problem to have a better understanding, understanding of what's going on. Sadly, uh, this is a work in progress, we still do not have a sequence capture data to make some conclusions but before finishing with my presentation and say thanks to you a couple days ago uh, we received MT DNA data that uh, at the beginning I said yes this is going to give me some insight about what's going on but then I said no I don't understand anything <laughs> and it's because here well, this is like other species of uh, Liangelus and other genus. Uh, here are the Western populations. Then they are split into Ecuadorian populations and then Eastern Andes and the Colombian, the southern part of, the southern uh, samples that we took are grouped. And if you can help me to solve it. That puzzle would be cool. But yeah, that's all we got till this moment. Thank you so much. Todo claro, también confundidos como yo. Muchas gracias. Okay, so we keep moving um, to another project. This is uh, two students from my lab that are going to present um, a project that has been going on since I joined Los Andes three years ago. Um, so they're going to show you how they basically became little guppy neurosurgeons. Um, and believe it or not, this is a project that started in a conversation we had at the University of Chicago with Roberto that started, you know, put a seed of like a uh, possibility in my brain. And then here we are like four years after actually getting it to work. So uh, with that, I'm going to let Laura and Maria Camila tell you what they've been doing. Thank you. And well, we are here today to tell you a little about um, our approach to perform gen editing into the brain of this goopy fish. Okay, so to start off, I want to give you a broad context of, of what gene editing is, probably most of you are associated with it, but we divided the impact of gene editing into major groups. 
So on the right, we have the possibility of silencing or activating certain genes that are associated with behavior to actually create a proper relation between the function of the gene and the behavior that we're studying. And on the right, we have the possibility of adding, editing, or deleting certain genes in order to correct or compensate diseases that are, are associated with abnormal genes. So in our lab specifically, we work with the right part, with the behavioral part, because as Mark said, this is also like our black matter. We have no idea of how to associate genes with behaviors and how to do like a very straightforward relation. So the question here is how can we edit our DNA? So we're gonna talk about three major steps in order to get to the editing and association of behaviors and genes. So to actually edit the gene, we need a tool, a complex that goes into the DNA and does the editing that we require. Then we need a nano vehicle, you'll see why, in which we load our tool to go into the cells. And then we need a protocol to go to take the nano vehicles inside the target site that we want to edit. So to begin, we are going to start with the editing tool. So probably some of you have heard about CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR-Cas9 is a revolutionary gene editing technology which allows us to do a very precise change into the DNA sequence. So specifically for us, we are going to design a single guide RNA that's going to allow us to go to a specific part of the DNA that we want to edit. And through an editing that we call knockout gene, we're going to silence a specific gene that's going to be associated with behavior. So for us, we work with adults, with goopy adults. The reason we do this is like for these three main reasons. We can actually control the behavior in adults. That's something that we cannot do when a fish is in development. We are not affecting the gametes if we go directly into the specialized cells. So we are not affecting future generations of the fish. And we have an accessible procedure. If we, would, if we wanted to do editing inside an embryo, that would be a very much complex procedure. So the problem with adults, the limitations that we found is the cellular uptake and the efficiency, but we're going to focus most of all in the cellular uptake. Why? So adults have developed many mechanisms in order to protect DNA. So nothing can enter, nothing can damage it. So let's say if we, if we, if we try to put inside this complex inside our cells, well, first of all, our body has a very rapid clearance, so we would just wash it off. Also, that lacks specificity, so it won't go into the cell membrane. Cell membrane won't recognize it and take it in. And we have nucleases everywhere that basically find free DNA and cut it in little pieces. So we need to find a solution to those problems, and that's our nano vehicle. So the nano vehicle is basically going to allow us to go inside the cells of the adult fish. So more specifically for the nano vehicles, well, scientists have gone through many types of nano vehicles, but recently the magnetic nano vehicles have shown to have very promising results. Why? So first of all, they allow targeted delivery thanks to the magnetic property. It also showed to have improved biocompatibility and bioavailability, which is very important. And due to, well, the chemical composition of the magnetite, we can do surface modifications that help us with these other properties. And finally, by manip manipulating the pH and temperature, we can do controlled release of the CRISPR complex. So this magnetite nano vehicle has already been effectively synthesized by another group of, of our lab. Uh, and that nano vehicle has already shown that we can immobilize the CRISPR complex on its surface. So we check that part. So now the question is, how do we take this nano vehicle with the CRISPR-Cas9 into the target tissue? So intracerebral ventricular microinjection is a technique that is widely used to deliver different substances, peptides, or editing complex into the central nervous system. Uh, we use this technique because uh, we have the blood-brain barrier that basically controls the brain uh, against possible harmful substances. And with this technique, we can directly inject all the things that we want into the brain, into the cerebral ventricles. So uh, if we want to use this technique, we have to standardize the procedure. So uh, there are three main uh, things to focus on 
to develop the micro injection process. And the first one is the fish position, because if the fish moves during the procedure, we can cause damage to the fish. And the second is the anesthesia, a continuous administration of the anesthetic, and this is related to the welfare of the animal. And the last one in, is all the things around the microinjection process. So um, this is not as easy as it sounds because we were working with a fish that is alive and we had to keep the fish alive during the whole procedure. Also, uh, to perform the microinjection procedure, we need to um, work with the fish outside of the water. And we uh, need to find a way to hold the fish in the right position during the whole procedure. So how can we do that? We realize that we need some kind of device that help us to overcome all these problems that we have. And we designed this microinjection bed that is this red thing right here. And as we can see, this microinjection bed help us to hold the fish, this is the fish, into the right position during the whole procedure. And it's covered with this foam that help uh, to avoid the dry out of the fish when we were working with the fish outside of the water. And um, we have the microinjection bed here. So, um, yeah. so this microinjection bed also have other features. It's adjustable to the width of the fish. And this is important because we were working with males and females at the same time as they have different sizes. Also give us stability during the whole procedure. We can easily handle connections to the life support system and allows wide visibility of the dorsal side of the head of the fish. So now with this microinjection bed, we can focus on the anesthesia and continuous administration of the anesthetic. So for the anesthesia procedure, we have three main steps. The first one is the immersion of the fish on a tray can bat. Then uh, we place to the fish into the microinjection bed and connect it to the life support system. And then we place the fish into our recovery tank with an oxygen plus supplier. So I want to highlight this step because in this step, we were performing the micro injections uh, for the fish. So uh, what is the life support system? It's just a gravity mediated perfusion system that help us to continuous administrate uh, the trican, that is the anesthetic that we were using to the fish. So it is composed by two uretrols, one with water and one with the anesthetic, and they are tied together with a three wire facet that finally it's connected with this drip um, micro drip system that finally reaches uh, the mouth of the fish as we can see in these pictures so uh, now that we have all the setup for the micro injections with the micro injection bed and with this life support system we can focus now on the micro injections so for the micro injections we need needles so uh, we design and manufacture the needles uh, with this micropipette puller and glass capillary filaments. And we were looking for a needle that released a volume between 200 nanoliters to 600 nanoliters, and that was sufficiently rigid to avoid breaking during the procedure. So we tried different parameters into the micropipette puller, and we finally get this configuration of needle that accomplished these two requirements. And then um, we focus on the injection side. So for the establishment of the injection side, uh, this, no, no, this, no. <laughs> this was easy uh, in this fish because as we can see in this picture, we can see like a silhouette of the brain on the dorsal side of the head. And at this point, we know that if we want to inject into the ventricles, we need to perform the microinjection between the telencephalon and the optic tectum, that is this region right here. And, um, so we perform different micro injections and we use this dye, Evan blue dye, to confirm that we were doing the injection in the right place, as we can see in this uh, picture. And then we try different volumes of the dye to evaluate the dye diffusion. So uh, at this point, we found that with different volumes of the dye, we can reach different regions of the head. So now we have all the setup for the micro injections. And uh, so what comes next? Okay, so remember the major steps, we've covered already the CRISPR, we've covered the nano vehicles, and Laura just told us about the ICV procedure, the protocol. So now, the next step for us, which we're working right now, like we're currently working on it, is the evaluation of the nano vehicle. So we now have to do the ICV protocol that Laura explained with the nano vehicles, not with the Evan Blue dye. 
So for this, we're going to do four different tests, evaluations in order to evaluate the injection. So we're going to start with the distribution to, to quantitatively evaluate the distribution of the nano vehicles, both in the brain and in the liver through mass spectrometry. And through staining with three different protocols, we're going to evaluate the morphology, the nano vehicle dispersion, and the cytotoxicity on the brain tissue. Then we're going to evaluate the behavior through two different tests. In the first one, we're going to have, okay, here is a little fish. So we're going to evaluate the amount of stress and anxiety caused on the fish after the microinjection. And in this one, here is the fish. We're going to evaluate the social behavior after the microinjection. And lastly, we're going to, oh no. lastly, we're, no, atrás, atrás. We're going to evaluate two biochemical markers which are associated to hepatic health. Then if we check all of these evaluations and if we have positive results, we have to evaluate the efficiency of CRISPR-Cas9 nano vehicles. So we have to know if they're actually entering the cell and doing the editing that we want to do. So we have to test things like behavior, if we're actually getting what we expected, the gene expression, if we're actually changing gene expression, and the percentage of cells that we managed to edit in one injection. And if that turns out to be fine, then we would have well, a complete protocol that will allow us to associate genes with behaviors that eventually we could even understand the role of genes in mental conditions, which is, you know, it's a black box. And or also like a very potential future, we could target neurogenetic disorders. So basically what we achieve is understanding the genetic underpinnings of behavior. And this is our team. That's one member of our team. Thank you. Do you have any questions? So first of all, this is awesome. I really, really appreciate the difficulties with setting up a new system for these things. So congratulations. Usually when I have seen or to a very small extent tried to work on changing some aspect of genetics in adults and in specific tissues, I've seen this done by trying to modify gene expression rather than the genome itself by putting in plasmids or microRNAs or something. And it's interesting to see you're doing CRISPR instead. So I wanted to ask if you've tried the others and why you are favoring CRISPR. It's very interesting. So um, we want to use CRISPR-Cas to perform a knockout because with these knockouts, we can know more about the function of this gene, because if you don't have the gene in any way, you can like evaluate, wait, this is happening when the gene is, it's not function yet, when it's broken. So maybe this can uh, help us to understand more the behavior that we are studying and not just to, yeah, like overexpress or silence the gene just with the knockout. Yeah, we are just doing a knockout. Okay. Any other question? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Last but not least, we got to the final talk of our little symposium with Ben Sheldon, who's joining us from Oxford, and he will tell us about his fantastic research. Um, I hope you guys are still, <laughs> you know, have still, <laughs> still a little bit of energy after this whole day for a very, very promising talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I, can I just do this by advancing there? Great. So thanks very much, uh, Nat Natasha and Daniel, for organizing this and for all of you for, for staying. It's always the most difficult talk just before lunchtime. We're all ready to go and eat something. But um, really impressive range of um, talks today. Um, I'm going to try and switch to talking about a kind of a long-term study of um, birds in their sort of natural environment that's been carried out um, near Oxford and that I've sort of inherited and, and been running for the last um, 20 years or so. And this talk's really about trying to understand 
um, or trying to disentangle the different kind of ways that we can think about responses to climate change in birds. Um, so some of it is kind of some established work and then other things are things that are just really starting to think about. So they're rather sort of unformed or kind of perhaps interesting discussion points that um, hopefully we'll have some more chance to talk about later. Okay. So um, the most recent IPCC report from last year, um, one of its sort of strong conclusions was that it's very likely that change in phenology, that's the timing of seasonal events of terrestrial species can be attributed to global climate change. And there's very high confidence in that. Um, and with more than 4,000 species, in which there's evidence. So apparently we know a lot about climate change in different systems. Um, you could say that, but um, I would say that actually we, we know rather little in some ways as well. So we know a lot about single species responses to climate change, but we know relatively little still about what happens when we have interacting species, particularly that are changing at different rates. And it's been a particular an area of interest for some time in biologists thinking about responses to climate change, to think about what happens with phenological mismatch when different parts of the system might change at different rates. So we actually know quite a lot, we don't know very much about that. And actually, many of these studies here, they're great studies, but they tend to be studies that have basically shown that you know, populations mean timing of some event will change over time and is correlated with climate. Um, that actually doesn't tell us very much about the ecology and evolution of those changes. And we're going to try and talk a little bit about how understanding those, um, we need to think a bit about that in terms of processes operating at different temporal scales and processes operating at different spatial scales. So there's four parts to this talk. So um, first is to just introduce you to this long-term population study. Talk a little bit about some of the work we've done in the past on population level responses to climate change. Sorry. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about effects of variance in the environment, um, and then also about the spatial scale of environmental effects. And these two last bits are a bit more kind of um, sort of preliminary and speculative. So the context of this study is um, here. This is the great tit, um, so a common woodland bird across much of um, Europe and, and goes right sort of into basically the, the super, super species that goes right across to Japan. And in 1947, um, David Lack um, founded a long-term population study of the Great Tits of Whiteham, which is just outside Oxford in central England. And that study has really continued um, to this day. Uh, so this year we'll be collecting the 76th year of data from this population study. And um, obviously <clears throat> a small part of that by me and a large part by people like David Lack and Chris Perrins before him and many, many other people who I'll thank at the end. And so that standardized population study, um, it takes advantage of the fact that great tits preferentially breed in artificial nest boxes. So we have just over a thousand nest boxes that these birds nest in, distributed across the woods. And that allows you to check those boxes in standardized ways and collect standardized data on things like how many eggs are laid when they hatch, uh, how they grow, um, who the parents are, you know, and the chicks and so on. So you can collect lots of standardized data. So we've now got almost 20,000 breeding attempts with life history data for about 114,000 birds. And we had our sort of 75th anniversary last year. So we made a few sort of infographics to kind of summarize. Oh, you can't see this that well. The blue doesn't show that well, but um, the blue is all the interesting numbers. So um, anyway, never mind. Some of those things are repeated. Um, I guess, you know, some of the fun things you can do, for example, by linking parents with their offspring is we can track these birds back through generations. So the longest lineage in our study is 35 generations. So the great tip that we can catch today, we can trace back to its great, 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 whatever parents that was flying around in 1960. Um, so, you know, lots of data, lots of standardized data that you can use to understand um, evolution and ecology of phenotypic variation in natural populations. And that's a lot of what we've done. And we've been interested for some time in thinking about population level responses to climate change. And you can sort of see um, these changes if you look at a, a character here. So this is an example of a character that we measure on every breeding attempt. Uh, this is the day that the first egg is laid by each female in its clutch. What I plotted here is just the distribution, the phenotypic distribution for each year from 1960 through to 2021. Um, 
so you can spend ages looking at a figure like this. You can see that, okay, there's you know, approximately something that looks a little bit like a Gaussian normal distribution each year, but actually its shape varies a lot from year to year. Some years it's very peaked, other years it's quite skewed, some years there are double peaks. One of the things you ought to be able to see, so the, the vertical line here is the average for the entire data set. Is that picking up okay? Yep. Um, and what you ought to be able to see is that actually the position of the peak relative to that line has shifted in recent years so that it now more often occurs to the left of the of the line. You can see that that is not a smooth shift in the sense it's, it's, it's gone backwards and forwards, but there's an overall trend there. And this is one of the first populations where we really started to see clear evidence for these population level responses. And thinking about the system, the key things to think about are the fact that these birds are adapted to feed on um, the caterpillars of a bunch of Lepidoptera species. The winter moth is a good example, that are themselves adapted to feed on the newly emerged leaves of deciduous trees, and the oak tree is a classic example of that. So great tits lay very large clutches, so the average clutch size is about nine eggs, and those young grow incredibly, incredibly rapidly, so they rely on a real peak in abundance of these caterpillars that are themselves relying on being able to feed on the newly emerged leaves of deciduous trees that are more nutritious than later on. So we've got this sort of tritrophic system, trees, um, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and <clears throat> this is in a sense a sort of a simplified version of it is oak tree, winter moth, great tit. And there's lots of interesting behaviourally and evolutionary and ecological questions to think about in terms of the timing of those events, how they vary in time and space, and particularly how robust they are to different kinds of perturbation. And it's an interesting problem because for this reason. So we think this is all being driven by the bud burst state of trees. So there's some, some distribution there that the trees um, come into, into leaf. And the caterpillars have to hatch out of their eggs to coincide with that, obviously, hatch too early, there's nothing to eat, hatch too late, the leaves have built up tannins and they're much more, much less pal palatable. And the caterpillars grow from little uh, hatchlings through to late in star larvae, which are nice, big, juicy caterpillars like that photo. And so the problem for the great tits is they have to time their egg laying date to coincide so that the, the peak in food demand for their young, which will be about 30 days later, coincides with the peak in abundance of these larvae. So it's a problem in so temporal synchronization that they've got to solve. And of course, this bud burst date is something that varies from year to year, depending on, on climatic conditions from year to year. So it's a moving target that you have to hit each year. Now, <clears throat> we've seen, if we look at measures of, for example, um, daily spring temperature in, in the sort of March and April, the period when these birds are breeding, we've seen a fairly clear increase in the average spring temperature over time um, in central England and, and it's true for many, many parts of the population. And at the same time, we've seen this change in the average egg laying data, the great that's over time. So again, it's a, it's a noisy relationship, but there's a clear decrease over time. So what's behind that, that change? <clears throat> well, if we, um, this is another measure of spring temperature. It doesn't really matter which one you take, you get the same answer from that. But if we use a a simple measure of spring temperature um, that turns out to predict really quite well the average the population mean laying date for the great tits. So each dot here is, is a, the average for a, for a year. So we've got the simple climatic index, which predicts the laying date of the great tits very well. Um, <clears throat> what's really interesting is that the same measure also predicts a standardized measure of timing of these uh, winter moth caterpillars. And we were we're lucky to have worked in White and Woods, which is a site where there's been lots and lots of ecology, different parts of the system going on. So there'll be people studying winter moth caterpillars um, at the same time as we're studying the great tits. So we've got data on the timing of the half full date, which is a standardized measure of peak abundance for the winter moth for um, almost exactly the same series of years as we have for the great tit behavior here. So given that they're both responding to the same climatic cue in approximately the same way, um, it's perhaps not surprising then if you put the two together. So if you plot the average half full date of the, the winter moths and the mean laying date of the great tits in any one year, there's a nice positive correlation between them. 
So this is over about 50 years. The great tits have <clears throat> maintained this quite nice synchrony with this key food supply for their offspring, despite quite a lot of climate change. So this is a system where apparently the, the tits and the caterpillars are changing in the same rate in response to climate, and that means that there's, there's no great problem with mismatch at all, okay? So very nice to show that, but of course, how is this change in the population produced uh, in these great tits? And because we've had repeated observations of individuals over multiple years, we can dive into individual variability um, in those birds and ask what mechanism produces the change in the, in the laying date. And it turns out to be actually all really explicable due to phenotypic plasticities. So in other words, the birds changing their breeding date in response to the, the temperature in any given year. And the way we can tell this is by um, taking individual birds that are observed in multiple years and asking how much they change their, their egg laying date um, in those pairs of years and then how different the climates were in those pairs of years. And then we plot those here and we draw the, the line of best fit through that and estimate the slope. That effectively gives us a sort of within individual response to temperature variation from year to year. And that slope is 0.071 days per degree centigrade on this measure here. And this is the population level response. So each of the dots here is just the population mean. And the slope of the relationship at the population level is almost identical to the within individual response. So in other words, we can entirely account for this population level response by what individuals get up to. So there's no need to invoke any kind of you know, adaptive ev evolutionary change over this time scale to explain the great disability to track their environment. Of course, <clears throat> what we think is that this phenotypic adjustment here is, of course, an evolved feature of these great tits that they're, um, they've so been selected to respond to variable environments, um, but they're just doing it at a rate which enables them to track their food supply um, just right. So, okay, so we saw this nice population level response here. <clears throat> Um, but what I've told you is a very sort of simplistic picture. It's talking about changes in the mean and it's changes at the whole population level. Um, we've recently started to get interested in, in um, some other ways of thinking about variation over time. So this was our change in average daily temperature um, in the, the early spring over time. We see this nice increase. Um, this is a, a pattern here which is basically just this figure is just estimated by taking the between year differences in the average, year, average spring temperature, and plotting them against time. And you can see that there's a really clear increase in the difference between pairs of successive years. So it's roughly a sort of threefold increase in the between year variance over the period that we've studied these birds. Um, so what that means is that as well as the springs changing their average conditions, we're also getting an environment where the conditions change um, to a larger degree from year to year than they did in the past. In other words, the birds are having to face more different problems each year than they did in the past. And <clears throat> this for me is a really interesting kind of situation to think about. You've got a system that's moving from one that's relatively stable to one that fluctuates a lot. What does that mean for which individuals are successful under those different sets of conditions? And, I can't tell you anything about that because that's something we've just started to, to work on. But variance you can measure in lots of different ways. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I just need some water. So changes in the mean are a bit boring because you, know, you, you can just measure that in one way, but variance can be measured in lots and lots of ways and lots of different scales. So as well as between, between year changes, we can measure uh, within year changes in, in, in the environment as well. And so here what we've done is to, we've measured the um, occurrence of what we could define as an extreme climatic event. And we just define that as a temperature that is in the extreme sort of two and a half percent of the tails of the, um, the day specific temperature distributions over a 56 year period for this site and between over three months when these birds are reproducing. And again, there's a pretty clear pattern over time here. So cold extreme events are getting 
relatively rarer over time and hot, hot extreme events are getting relatively more common over time. So we've seen a sort of change in the, the variance from sort of, sort of cold events becoming rarer and warm events becoming commoner. So what could we say about their effects on these birds? So we know that actually <clears throat> the occurrence of these extreme events, so these are um, cold extreme events here, the number of events um, on the x-axis, and this is hot extreme events here, and these are different measures of reproductive success of the birds. We know that um, the occurrence of these extreme events are linked to reproductive outcomes. They depend a bit on reproductive stage, so that the um, if we have an increasing number of cold extreme events during a reproductive attempt, that's associated with relatively low rates of success, um, particularly during the um, initial period, the sort of from hatching to about day seven, which is before the chicks can really thermoregulate very well. So cold events are not a good thing for them, but actually what we see is almost the opposite for these um, hot events, so later on during development, that more warm events are associated with actually higher rates of success. But it's not quite as, so, so you could go back and say, okay, that's, that suggests that, okay, cold events are becoming less common and hot events are becoming commoner. So this is a, a good thing for these great tits because these things are going to become less common over time. These are becoming more common. So overall, they should be doing relatively well out of this change in the variance. Um, but it's actually not quite as simple as that because um, <clears throat> we have to think about the difference between the oops, um, the the general risk of an event versus the risk that an individual actually experiences. And so this is really a plot of the the general risk over a period of three months, the number of cold and and um, warm extreme events. Um, but what we should actually be doing is calculate the occurrence of these events in relation to um, a bird's specific um, breeding time. And so what's um, shown here is the, the yellow curve is the probability of experiencing um, a hot climatic event for birds given their breeding time. And the gray line here is uh, what the probability of you account for and um, that bird's individual timing. So you can see there is an increase in the risk of experiencing these events, but actually most of that is explained by the fact that birds are adjusting their their timing of breeding. It becomes actually rather more interesting if we look at the cold events here, where sort of counterintuitively, although there's been a decrease in the general occurrence of cold extreme climatic events over time, um, actually that's not true for the individual risk of exposure. So particularly during this period, immediately post hatching, um, but also a little bit during incubation as well, the risk of an individual bird encountering an extreme cold event has actually increased over time. And much of that increase is, is explained actually by the fact that the birds are breeding relatively earlier in the year than they were at the start of the, of the, the study. And so what we think this means is that <clears throat> despite on average springs being relatively warmer and earlier, the bird's phenotypic plasticity in breeding time, the fact that they're adjusting their time to breed earlier and earlier, is pushing them into earlier calendar dates where the risk of encountering one of these extreme cold events actually is higher. And so it's an interesting case where the birds are adjusting their behavior, the sort of mean is pushing them earlier, but then they run into this problem of different variances of different kinds of climatic events. And that actually it's an interesting possibility that these extreme events that become more and more frequent in the early stages of breeding can actually act as a sort of break on the bird's ability to continue adjusting to earlier and earlier breeding times. So anyway, so that's an interesting idea that we're trying to work on at the moment is to think about what the interaction is between your response to the mean uh, climatic change and how that exposes you to different variances in the climate as well. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about um, scale. For time. Okay. Um, so what I've talked about so far has been really analyses that have been taking a whole population and kind of collapsing it down to a single data point. But we know that that's not really true for 
most populations. And so if we think about individual great tits in different parts of Weiss and Woods, each of the dots here is one of the nest boxes. This is about four kilometers across. So it's not a big site, but actually there's a lot of environmental heterogeneity there, as there is almost anywhere you go um, and start measuring environmental heterogeneity. We know that most organisms actually are pretty tied to a pretty small part of space, and that's certainly true of these great tits, particularly when they're breeding, because they're having to return to a, to a given point in space to bring food back to the young several hundred times a day. So they should be very sensitive to fine scale variation in space. And most of the work that we've done in the past and other people have done in the past about how populations respond to climatic variation over time has really ignored what spatial differences might mean for, for thinking about that. And if we look at our long-term data here, so um, what I plotted here on the left is, this again is a map of white and woods, each of the dots there is one of the positions of one of the nest boxes, and the size of the dots is proportional to how many times it's been occupied, so how many years it was, it was used. And it's scaled so that you can see the relative uh, first egg date in that individual nest box. And so blue is early and, and red is, uh, uh, reddish brown is, is late. <clears throat> and you can see that there's lots of variation here. And it's kind of one of these patterns that you can spend ages looking at this and exploring the variation. You can quantify it in different ways by looking at um, you know, spatial autocorrelation. Um, so to some extent, there are large scale drivers of variation here which might be linked to things like, for example, altitude or exposure or so on. But then other parts of the population, there are surprisingly large differences occurring over small spatial scales. So you can see you know, this particular box up here, which is always late, but is surrounded by many boxes that are relatively early. And you can see similar variation here as well. So there are lots of spatial structure here, and some of it's occurring at very fine scales. We could also do a similar analysis looking at the, the basically the within site response to climate change. So each of these arrows here, I don't know how visible they are, but the arrows, the, their direction and their color is proportional to how divergent that site was in terms of its response to climate change relative to the mean in the population. So blue arrows are boxes that were advancing faster than the average in the population. And Red arrows are boxes that were advancing slower than the average in the population. And again, that has quite a lot of spatial structure as well. Um, and we, we spent a little bit of time trying to explain what correlates there might be of that variation. So why it is that some bits of the population are showing strong responses, others are showing weak responses. And the best thing that we can come up with as, a, as an explanatory variable relates to, to oak trees. So we collected a lot of data on the spatial distribution of oak trees in White and Woods. There are about 6,000 oak trees. We've measured the, um, the tree health of those trees. The oak trees are affected by a, a sort of an oak dieback, sort of chronic wasting disease effectively, um, which you can also see is spatially non-randomly distributed. And if you ask about the correlation between the distribution of oak dieback and being a slow response, slow responder to climate change, there's quite a strong correlation between the two. So that's the best factor we can find to explain that. So that's suggesting that potentially quite small scale variation might be underpinning within population variation in responses to, to climate change. And the last thing that we're doing in this area at the moment, and this is some work that's literally just started this spring. So people are out there at the moment um, starting to collect this data is we've been trialing um, using drones, flying drones over White and Woods um, to basically fly drones every couple of days over the woods to get snapshots of every individual tree. There are about 400,000 trees, so it requires quite a lot of post flight processing of images to extract from those individual um, data about individual trees trajectories through time. So we get effectively a bud burst date for each individual tree. And the idea is to, over the next few years, try and underlie, overlay that data on the tree level responses over time to data on insects and birds. Um, but this is really just work that's just starting at the moment. And I, I find this kind of thinking about spatial scale effects at that scale. So this is really at the you know, tens of meters. Um, 
particularly interesting thing thinking about the limited dispersal that some of the insects and birds that we're looking at have during their lives. Okay, so <clears throat> I guess what I've been trying to say today is that <clears throat> we could think about responses of populations to climate change um, in terms of falling on two different axes. We've got a temporal axis and a spatial axis. We have a lot of evidence and a lot of and a bit of understanding about what it is that's happening when populations are when we study things at the level of the population over large temporal scales. So we've got populations responding over decades to, to changes in the climate. But there are other scales that um, we should be thinking about as well. So we should be thinking about <clears throat> within year variants, for example, the, the increasing likelihood that there are going to be extreme climatic events occurring at higher frequency than in the past and what that means for the behavior of populations, particularly how these two things might interact um, in interesting ways. We can also think about <clears throat> the smaller spatial scale. So why should we assume that each of these is a population, is a summary for an entire population in a year? Actually, if we, if we dig into the population, we can see that individual individual locations within populations might respond at quite different rates as well. And ultimately, I think all of that requires us to go to measure things at the scale where actually organisms are mostly operating, which is at this relatively small temporal and spatial scale. Um, and that's work that we're just starting now. So, um, so that's really where we're trying to go with this, this work in the future. And um, I think I will close by thanking. Um, so <clears throat> every year, the data that we use here is collected by a team of people funded by some very nice people. Um, this could, wouldn't be possible without these people and, of course, many hundreds of people who've collected the data over the years. So thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks for, for a great talk. Um, I have a question regarding the within um, spatial variation. So in your map, we have like blue dots over like concentrated over, I would say north, yeah. probably not. <laughs> and then again, you have some over like the south. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there is some sort of social effect, uh, transmission of when do you lay synchrony? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, I, I would, if I could, in a sense, tell you how much time we've spent trying to think about how we separate um, spatial and social processes and driving this behavior. Um, I mean, really, the, I guess, as you'll, as you'll know, the problem is that social and spatial effects are very tightly correlated at small scales. And so without um, sort of doing, I guess, an experiment that, that, that manipulates the thing that matters, but the problem is we're not quite sure what thing would matter if it was a social cue. Um, we don't really have an easy way to, to disentangle those two. I mean, it is a thing we've been thinking about quite a bit is, you know, can we model, for example, the spread of laying dates through the population as a diffusion process on a, a social network? Um, the problem is that we don't really have a very um, good, so, so to do that, we would have to assume a model for how individuals are connected, which ultimately would be a spatial model because we don't measure, we don't have a way to measure how individuals are interacting or for example, what signals they might be getting from each other at that time of year. So, so it's quite a difficult problem to tease apart. I mean, it's a really good question. And it's, I think the possibility that there's a social component to these behaviors is something that we should consider actively, but actually how you disentangle that from fine scale environmental effects is really difficult, I think. So um, certainly without doing an experiment, I think the experiment is quite a difficult one to do as well. So, so yeah, good question, but I don't have an answer. Thank you, Ben, that was fascinating. Uh, so, so in your first example, you, you said that essentially all of the change in phenology you're seeing is attributable to you know plasticity but 
can you comment on you know possible evolutionary effects because you might i guess some individuals some genotypes might be more plastic than others and is there any potential for selection acting on plasticity itself in, in the system for, for sure yeah that's a that's a really good point um so we we've tried to look at this but actually i think it's we don't really have a system that is suitable for looking at that because um these birds have you know, the sort of large clutch size, low adult annual survival rates. So annual survival rates are less than 50%. So most individuals are only observed once. So estimating plasticity at the individual level is fraught with the problem that you can only do it for individuals that survive multiple years and therefore are a non, a pretty biased subset of your data. So. So there was there was some papers that tried to do this um, sort of 15 years or so ago, and um, I think actually people think that that the statistical support for doing that probably isn't really very strong with a data set of this kind. So to do that, you really need a, a thing where you can study it either in the field under repeated conditions, you have many more repeats than we can, or you know experimentally under when you're manipulating conditions, and that's not really possible for us so um so yeah completely take your point but it's not something we can easily address um and of course it might be that uh, my you know <clears throat> i'm not um i'm not saying there's no selection happening here but but in terms of the population level response it could be it, it's all entirely consistent with it being just down to plasticity at the individual level so Sorry. Sorry. No worry. Um, I have a question related to the plasticity of the birds, yeah. and I don't know if maybe the actual climate change that uh, like, like the world is facing right now could affect the proportion or maybe the rate of male and females in birds uh, because of their own plasticity. I mean, uh, there is known that some other species, for example, re some reptiles, they are changed their proportions of males and females uh, related with the temperature. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if this could happen to birds and it could represent like a uh, negative uh, kind of plasticity yeah. um, with the temperature. That's a great, great question. And I think that there is a tiny bit of evidence that under some conditions you can um get sort of developmental changes in sex in birds um but it's it's pretty rare and i think you have to do some pretty extreme things and i think one of the reasons we sort of know that is that um i think if that were easy the poultry industry would be doing that routinely because you know they have to get rid of all these sort of wasted all these male chicks that are useless right so um so i think attempts to do that basically have not worked very well with birds as i say there's a handful of small sort of almost anecdotal cases where there has been sort of you know, environmental sex determination reported in birds but it's certainly much less common than in the reptiles and i don't think over the the scales we're looking at here that it's likely to be um important so but yeah good question so uh it seems that the birds have got adaptive plasticity which matches them well to the oak trees and then the question is do the oak trees, is the oak trees plasticity well matched to what is optimal for the oak trees? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question, Mark. I mean, I think the, one of the things that we, um, we're hoping to do with this newest bit of this project is actually to ask questions about, um, for example, what is, um, what's, the, what's, what's your ideal feeder type if you're a tree? And how does it depend on what your neighbors are doing? Because you can imagine that you know, rates of herbivory are going to be highly dependent on whether you're synchronized with your neighbors or not. So actually, you can imagine that in some, under some circumstances, it might make sense to actually, in a sense, there's a, there's, a, in, there's a negative frequency dependent element to what is optimal if your likelihood of being attacked by herbivores or parasites or something depends on what you do. So there's a there's a dimension to this that is much more i guess interesting than just you know responding to temperature right it also probably depends on what you're doing relative to your 
immediate neighbors and how that interacts with the things that are kind of you know doing nasty stuff to you so um for sure that's a really interesting question and, and that sort of applies a little bit also to the the you know the caterpillars as well right you know in terms of um when's the optimal timing for them is it just about the food or actually does it also relate to you know your their enemies and similarly for birds as well right um so there's a there's, there's more to this than just kind of pure environmental drivers and, and so i think measuring things at the individual level gives you the potential to dig into those questions so. anyway right. thanks ben that was great um Nah, yo, yo quería terminar agradeciendo primero a Natasha, que fue la que movió esto mucho más. Soy malo para contestar el WhatsApp, pero al final pasó. Eh, gracias a todo el equipo de ingeniería por lo que hizo. Eh, Brian en Ciencias Biológicas también nos ayudó un montón. Eh, thanks to our guests and everybody who shared their research today. I think it was a lot of fun. And hope you guys enjoy the rest of your trip. Gracias a todos. I also uh, wanted to say a few words uh, to especially thank all the students that were involved in organizing because I think I didn't do it, they did it. So um, I came up with the idea, they did absolutely everything with Juan Jose and with Gina and everyone in each department that that uh, joined. So I want a special applause for like every single one of you that organized this. Um, it was truly a wonderful day. Uh, thank you, Ben, for closing this with a fantastic talk. It was really, really great to hear all of you today. So with that, I hope you all have a great lunch and thank you for joining us today. Uh, and they need a photo. I don't know where. <laughs> in, in, on, the, on the stairs of the auditorium right here, they just want to take a photo of everyone. If you can just take one second. Uh, to make our photographer very happy. ¿En dónde o en las de justo? Del cual las a las que están justo aquí, the ones right out here.